Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome, everybody, back. Hopefully, this is going to be one heck of a new year. <clears throat> That's what we all hope. It's been very quiet, kind of raining the last couple of days up here in Maryland. Uh, got to go over to Nathan's house this uh, past Saturday, and uh, I made him a big dinner for lunch. Uh, my daughter was working. Uh, retail workers don't stop. So it was the boys at home, and I made them a big platter of baked chicken drumsticks and uh, some of my Puerto Rican rice and beans, and they had a fantastic time. I had some fun with Nathan, uh, gave him his last Christmas present, and then we sat down and watched some videos. He also shot some videos as well, and he was showing me what he's been doing. The kid's getting really good at this. He's getting all the lingo down and all the, you know, what YouTubers, gamers uh, use. And his dad has been setting him up with a new laptop and all kinds of stuff. But they are going back to school tomorrow. So I will be picking him up for homework after school. Mm. I haven't been doing too much down here. Just haven't been feeling very well lately. And so I've been hanging out upstairs too much. I really need to come back down here and do a few more videos. I have so many different subjects to cover that I really should get out. And hopefully this coming month, right now, actually, January will be the time for me to uh, get back on track. Today, I have some topics that I'm going to cover. I had a couple that I missed. Didn't have enough time last week, even though we stayed almost three and a half hours. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and cover those today. And again, as always, do not hesitate to just ask, 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 ask. And I will try to help you out. I had a conversation with Mike Lee and as well as someone else. I'm not going to disclose the name, but they are very knowledgeable, the both of them. And we're trying to solve a problem from an individual who was actually here last Sunday in... Let me remember, it was um, a Canon TS9020, which is similar to the 8320, the, yeah, yeah, 8320 that I have. And so they were getting banding on their prints. I also remember him going to my Facebook group and showing some of the examples. And again, these, just like my 8320, they are not really photographic printers. They are basically all-in-ones. They have scanner built in. They print on CDs and DVDs that are printable. All kinds of different multifunction type features on them. And so they're great to have. Uh, they're just simply not really easy to refill. They can be refilled, but there are no chips. There are no resetters for these cartridges. They use, I think, the 250s and the 251s cartridges from Canon. Now, you can buy compatible cartridges for those uh, models of carts and use them. Again, I'm not 
big on using compatible cartridges. Well, when it comes to a printer that just simply does not allow you to easily, let's just say, um, you know, modify them to refill them and so forth, I go I go compatible, especially with the low cost that you pay for these cartridges now. I'm going to show you something after I acknowledge those who are here. We have 23 already logged on and watching. Again, do not hesitate to come on the chat. Tell us who you are. It's the same drill every Sunday. Who you are, where are you watching from, and what printers you are interested in or already own. And if you do not own a printer, just you know whatever interests you, go ahead and share it with us. We would love to know that. So we have uh, a good handful already on the chat here. We're up to 23 now. We just gained one more. We'll see how many we get day after New Year's. Uh, I don't know whether there are any ball games today. They, there might be. So people may be watching those. And, of course, you can always catch this later as it becomes an actual video. Right now it's a live stream, so you can interact with us. Uh Harold Goldberg, always here with us. He is in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm sure it's kind of rainy and yucky over there. Tomorrow is going to be really chilly. It's going to go down to like 37. Right now, it's um, almost T-shirt weather outside. He's got a Pro 100 PCSE in QMH1, Rick Johnson clean cards, release holders, again, from a rainy Richmond, of course, just like up here. Hmm. Rudy is here, Halle Moom from L.A. He is the maker and designer of the holders that we all love to use. He says, Happy New Year's to Jose, Harold, and all my friends in this channel. I wish you all a healthy, wealthy, and prosperous New Year. The same thing to you, my friend. Hopefully, you will have a lot of sales. I'm not going to say I hope you wear out your 3D printer, but yeah, I hope you wear it out making a ton of units to sell. Miss Wendy from Belgium is here, and she wishes us the best, which is awesome. Thank you, my dear. Hope you enjoyed tonight's or today's presentation, depending what part of the world you are watching from. Richard Bender from rainy Hagerstown, trying to discover why my color monkey no longer connects to my computer, uses i1 software, that was work that has worked flawlessly in the past. Hmm, that's strange. Did you just recently do an update on your OS? That's the only the only reason I would I would expect that to not you know no longer work. And I guess there has been a switch. I think X Ray just kind of dumped these lower or prosumer or consumer level uh, spectrophotometers. Um, I, I'm going to have to install this and see if it still works. I have Windows 10. I have not migrated to Windows 11. I'm not going to do that until it is absolutely proven that it will work with all of my printers. And um, I really don't want to deal with a, a completely different user interface. If that's, if that's what they are doing, I have no clue. I haven't really bothered watching any of the uh, videos on uh, Windows 11. We're going to talk about you, uh, Richard. We're going to um, open up that image you sent me, those two images. I haven't printed them, but I, I'm going to print the one with the green leaves on my XP15000. I'm going to give that a chance because if I can pull that off on the XP15000 as opposed to on, you know, on the Pro 1000, which I know, I know can handle, you know, a pretty big gamut, but I also check gamma tested your image and it is within at least as far as photoshop is concerned that means that there shouldn't be much difference now i would go ahead and do a um like soft proof through the uh profile that you are using to print this with and see if it displays that change of what you see on the green leaves and we'll show that image in a minute let me go ahead and uh, remove this like so. I have it here already on my desktop. 
And I just want to show folks what we are talking about. Okay, get back up there, you. I need to move things around a little bit. We'll go ahead and pop that over there and uh, share it. Let me hide you, and here we go. So this is what we are talking about. It seems like like this is going to go crazy when you try to gamut uh, warning, check it, you know. And amazingly, it does not. Hardly anything changes. So what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and print this baby, and then we're going to go ahead and compare it to what we have. Now, be aware that the monitor that I am displaying this on is not calibrated. Okay, so that may have something to do with the uh, the fact that it may not match when I when I hold the actual print next to it. So, but anyway, uh, the way I'm looking at it, I expect it to have the same strong greens. I hope we'll see. Greens sometimes are a little bit difficult with some ink sets, especially when you go third party, which you have done. So, I suspect that maybe it took a while for the ink out inks to manifest themselves in your r3000 which is what you use being that it is a stationary cartridge printer it takes a while for those inks to migrate through the you know the ink lines that ribbon of uh, ink lines and you know through the print head uh, dampers and such until finally it makes its you know emergence i guess on two prints and then you may be able to see a difference someone just recently had that uh where they saw a difference between pc se for the pro 10 compared to oem now i don't recall such a thing happening to me it was pretty seamless so we'll, we're going to cover that a little bit we're going to cover that as a subject why that may happen and why it may not happen to some people and what are the factors that may be uh, guilty, I guess you can say, in causing such a difference in change when you go from one end to the other. In other words, I'm going to try to try to cover about how to migrate from your expensive OEMs, which may be a little bit cost prohibitive for you at this point. Depends what you are in, you know, into as far as printing, whether you sell or you don't sell. Is it for just fun, for recreational purposes? You know, it, it could be an expensive little undertaking. So that's why we go to third party. And I could do a very drastic comparison. I could actually compare my Pro 10, which is now running fully OEM. I get my inks out of Pro 1 cartridges, which um, I get. And I extract whatever ink is left in them and then compile all of these different colors in bottles, and then I use that to refill my Pro 10 cartridges. So I'm, I can I can easily set up a set of cartridges with uh, other inks and test it instantly. I could also use a third-party compatible set that I have. Yo-Yo Ink, like a Yo-Yo, the toy. Yo-Yo Inks sent me Pro 10 uh, compatible cartridges. I can pop those in and make a direct comparison between the two and the beauty of this is that unlike the r3000 or any other uh stationary cartridge type printer the the change between oem and the unknown inks is pretty much instant because the minute you this not the minute the second you close down your lid is going to recognize that you either change some cartridges Change the whole set of cartridges, refills, whatever. You remove cartridges. The moment you pop them back in and you close that lid, it runs a purge cycle and it clears away whatever was inside the print head. And if you're really worried, just run another cleaning cycle and then proceed now with 100% assurance that you're printing with that new ink set. You will see the differences, especially if you are using the same color managing, you know, color management settings. In other words, in my case, I would use Canon paper with the matching Canon profile, which is made for OEM inks. 
then I switch over to the other inks and I make sure that I keep those settings identical. I want everything identical. The only variable here would be the new inks and that will then show up as a change in output, maybe in neutrality, maybe in affecting certain colors, um, reds more than you know greens or blues or whatever. You will be able to compare that, especially if you're using a standard image to make that comparison. So we're gonna check that on the XP15000, this baby right here. We're gonna print that a little bit later and I, I'm going to be using Q image. I'm going to be using um, a sub glossy paper, which I am in love with, and a custom profile. That is key. So we're going to try to extract the maximum amount of quality out of the A sub, out of the precision SE inks I'm using on the XP15000, and this beautiful image right here. All righty. We have Visi Today, Winnipeg, Canada, Rick Johnson, Pro 100, CLI 42 cartridges, excuse me, from Rick, a PCSE, and Inks, Inks and QImage Ultimate. We have Jerry, Uncle Jerry, uh, Canon Pro 100, Rick Johnson. Again, okay, sounds repetitious because it is. Everyone's using that combo. It really, really works. And of course, we know where you're from, my friend. It's okay. Here's someone that appears to be new. Grisa Grisaptimus. That's an interesting name. Hey there, first time here watching from Oklahoma City. Don't have a printer yet, but I have started doing research on which printer to get and stumble on your channel a few days ago. That's happening. That's happening, and I love it because you know what? Let me let me just give you a little bit of information. The surname Rodriguez, which is mine, that I inherited from my family, my parents, both sides, by the way, were Rodriguez's, my mom as well as my dad. It comes from a term um, in old Spain called, basically referring to the son of Rodrigo. Rodrigo was somebody, and he... I guess that variation came from that. Anyway, regardless, it's one of the most widely used surnames out there. In some countries, it is number one. Jose Rodriguez is like John Smith. Okay. If I was going to a hotel and I didn't want, you know, in Latin America and I didn't want anybody to know, I was I would sign Jose Rodriguez. So it's like John Smith. That way nobody knows my name, my real name. Okay. Well, if you look for Jose Rodriguez on YouTube, you land on my channel. And that's that's ridiculous, amazing to me, because the odds of that happening are so high against me, okay, <laughs> against anyone actually finding my channel. But if you just look Jose Rodriguez, and especially if you add the word printing, you will definitely land on my channel. So anyone who may be out there who does not know that we exist, our little family here exists. Go ahead and just use that that search criteria, and you will definitely find us. The same thing in uh, Facebook. All right. Well, anyway, I hope that we are able to help you. Um, if you want to um, interact a little further, go ahead and share with us what it is that you want to get into as far as printing goes. What are your goals like? For instance, do you want to print things like this? Do you want to print portraiture? Do you want to print landscapes? Are you going to print on fine art papers? Are you going to print on canvas? Are you going to print on just glossies? Are you just making giveaway six by you know four prints? Are you, you know, tell us what you are hoping to accomplish, and then we can go from there to try to lead you down the right road because there's so many ways you can go wrong. Okay, so don't hesitate. We are here to help. We're all a wonderful family. We love each other to death. And so that's what I suggest you do. If you're going to hang around with us for the next several hours, go ahead and share with us what it is that you're, you know, you're trying to achieve your goals. Why are you interested in doing this? 
Charles Verbruggen from Belgium, Antwerp, beautiful. I went to the port of Antwerp. I keep saying that every time to pick up my car that got shipped from the U.S. It took about two months to get there. I believe it was. And I drove back with someone else um, who was also leaving. I went up with someone who was uh, taking their automobile to ship back to the U.S. And then I came back in my car after we filled it up with uh, petrol, which was extremely expensive back in, uh, when was that? 80, 1980, maybe? Yeah. Wishing everybody a healthy and happy 2022. It's hard for me to believe we are a 2022. I used to watch science fiction movies where today we would be flying in our cars, according to them, according to Hollywood. That hasn't happened yet, but, you know, maybe maybe Tesla has working on something like that. Yeah. Anyway, from Antwerp, Belgium, Canon Pro 95000 Mark II and a Pro 1000. Awesome. Bill Graney from Westchester, Pennsylvania. All the best for New Year to all. Emmanuel is here from France, Normandy, the beautiful city of Rouen, Arun, I can't pronounce that, Pro 300 Q1, Ink Owl, all right, QMH1, Richard Bender, nothing has changed since my last calibration, all right, we're going to get to that, we're going to get to you in a second, my friend, and again, I, I, I need to have you come back, and uh, I haven't had a chance to explore all of those new functions in that neural filter in Photoshop. And I would love for you to come back and uh, we can play around here in front of everybody and show what that um, new feature can do. It's really amazing, really amazing. I actually used it. I showed you guys last week on my uh, grandson's school picture where he was very, a uh, little bit of an awkward type smile. Wasn't really real. And I made it real just by clicking on that filter. Amazing. Nikos Grigoladis. He is Greek, I believe. He's from Cyprus, I think. Um, Canon TM200, that's like a big plotter, I believe, and a G540. That might be from Canon, possibly. Jeff Thompson is here from South Louisiana. Hope you guys didn't get too much damage from those storms down there. Gregory, Happy New Year from Toronto. Mike from Ottawa, Canada. Stumble in your channel when just when I check you most. When I received my Pro 10 about a year ago, would have been lost without you and the community. Thank you. Appreciate that. I'm glad. That makes me that makes me feel good. Makes me want to continue doing this. Melissa. P from Livonia, Michigan, suburb of Detroit, Livonia. That's an interesting name. That sounds almost uh, Ukrainian or something. Uh, clean my Pro 10 and soon we'll put in new sets, carts soon. Hope it all works well. Thanks for your instruction. And what are you uh, switching to? Any particular ink? That would be nice to know. Then I can sort of... Um, help you out a little bit more. So speaking of that, you know, a lot of people make a switch. And again, like I just said earlier, it depends. We got 41 folks right now. We're going to go ahead and uh, jump into a, a topic here that deserves some detailed discussion because it covers so many different possibilities. And you can easily get lost. You can really easily get lost unless you're really good at detective work, unless you're really good at uh, uh, troubleshooting and that sort of thing. Let me see what we got here. Melissa says, uh, we have for now OEM, but soon to pre. You mean precision colors? If that's what you are using, then you, you're going the right uh, way. Uh, Ink Owl is also very good precision colors. It's a little bit better because they incorporated one color that was, yeah, precision inks. They incorporated one color that is very critical, and that is red. 
they are using original red, not any third-party red, because kinks, yeah, I know what you meant. No problem. Happens to me all the time when I type. So let's go ahead and, and start. Let's go ahead and start this uh, little discussion here. Wait a minute. Pepe Le Pew is here, and I know he is not a skunk, folks. He is a real person. Hello, Jose. Happy New Year. Do you know if the standard CLI chip resetter uses a default 5.5 volt USB to DC cable? I I can show you that. Um, I can show show you that right now. This is what it uses. Okay. And of course, here is the resetter. You see the little pin sticking out that mates with this. And you got to make sure that you insert it securely. It makes it like a little click at the end. Watch right there. Make sure you do that. So I don't know whether, you know, that is, I guess just that, that is a standard uh, cord that you can buy. Um, but yeah, 5.5 volts. And you, I'm, I'm just running it off of my Pro 10's USB output. Yeah. And it works just fine. All right. Let's go ahead and begin. So monitor calibration, of course, number one. We're going to talk about the many causes of non-accurate output. What does that mean? Well, I just mentioned monitor, right? So what do we use to sort of compare, let's just say, um, what our output is? How do you know your output is correct? You have nothing else to compare to. You cannot go back to that place that you shot that landscape at and compare that print to what you see because you're going to go there on a different day of the year from the day you shot it. The lighting is going to be different. There's no way to really compare. There's no control. So output cannot be controlled unless you're using a standard image, period. So you have to use a control image. That means that image is never to be edited or altered in any way, shape, or form. It is the same for me as it is the same for you if you download it from my Facebook group you will get the one that used to be the universal one. Unfortunately, the actual site of the people who created it seems to be not working. The link seems seems to not work. And so I am so glad that I have it on my Facebook group for anyone to grab. So you open that up and you print it. And you print it. If you're using a Canon paper, this is going to be a broken record. Okay, bear with me. If you're using a Canon printer, you're going to use Canon paper. If you're using an Epson printer, it's going to be on Epson paper. What kind of paper? Any of the common photo papers that are available in that drop-down menu for media. When you go to your driver and you choose your media, you will find a luster or a glossy paper. Make sure that paper you are using is matched to that name. The same thing with Canon. Then you're going to make sure that the driver is controlling color. Why? Because in the case of Canon, you can actually set that matching color output to ICM. I-C-M. And then that will then match it to that same paper profile. You don't have to think at all. Just make sure... That if you're using Pro Luster, you choose Pro Luster and then ICM. How do you get to that matching tab? On Windows, you click on a little box that says color slash intensity manual adjustment. It opens up a secondary uh, interface that allows you to manually adjust color. We don't want to do that. We want to let the driver do it through the ICC profile for Pro Luster. So you go to matching and then you choose ICM, ICM or driver matching, it doesn't matter. If you choose ICM, you can then also choose a rendering intent. You do not want to use perceptual for this. You want to use relative colorimetric because it will not alter or shift any colors. 
that may be out of gamma. And there are some out of gamma colors in that evaluation image. We want to keep those the same out of gamma condition. We want to test to see what your printer can do. Okay, that's what we are using that control image for. Otherwise, who cares, right? We want to determine what is the best output our new printer can produce. And we're going to feed it an image that's 90% of it can be handled, but the last 10% is impossible for a lot of printers. In fact, most printers. And so we want to test it. We want to push it to its limit. So if you put in Pro Luster on the tray, the feed tray, you're going to choose Pro Luster on the media choice menu. And then you're going to go to color slash intensity manual adjustment matching and set it to ICM and then relative colorimetric. Okay. Print. If your printer, when you first installed it, or at this point, say you disregarded doing a verification, you immediately started printing your unknown images on an unknown calibrated or badly calibrated monitor. And it's not too late. You can still make sure, you know, you can still test your printer's ability to output correctly. Go back and load that image, print it the way I just described on Epson. It's the same way. Choose a paper that you have loaded in that menu. Go to color, color mode or mode. It, it will be different on every driver, unfortunately. There's no consistency, it seems. But you're going to go to color, and there you're going to choose ICM. Not, uh, I think it's Epson standard sRGB. No, 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 no. Not Adobe RGB 1998. No, 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 no. ICM. That will link it to the profile for that paper you chose and you physically have loaded. That will be a color management match. Okay, that will be a match. Just like if you were doing it manually, we're going to get in, not get into that yet. Okay, so then you print it. I guarantee you it's going to look... like this. It's going to be neutral. Don't judge the lack of neutrality you may see here, but indeed it is neutral. Here's another type of a standard image that I have available. Again, you look at this and you you examine it and you go, wow, I wish my prints will come out this good. Yeah. You look at the various prints. Here it doesn't have too much in the way of like actual images that you would then find yourself shooting. Um, basically, this is all kind of a more scientifically designed standard image. You have your color patches here. You have this. You have all of this information. You just look at it. You're looking at, look at that. Transitions. You're looking for banding that may occur where it shouldn't occur. Faces of the little kids. Do they look normal to you? By golly, yes, they do. Then I'm okay. The grays. Are they neutral? All of these gray patches, are they neutral or do they have a cast? Do they lean toward green? Do they lean toward red? Okay, toward yellow, whatever. If they do not, that means your printer indeed can print something neutrally. I would be kicking my heels and doing a happy dance if this is what I got from my printer. Okay, the very first time. So that's what you're looking for. Now, once you establish that, everything else is a variable. Everything else is an unknown. And that's where it gets interesting. But that's the thing that you have to do. Imagine if you had any, any kind of instrument, and before you use it to measure unknown conditions, like a thermometer, like your oven, like your microwave, it says it's a 1,200 watt, but it cannot pop popcorn at the setting that, you know, it automatically makes you use because it really isn't 1,200 watts. You know, it takes you another little extra 30 seconds to be able to pop most of the, your popcorn kernels. You know, you, you get what I mean. You need to know whether that thermometer really is calibrated. So that's how you determine this. You need to know whether that printer can output correctly. Output what? 
a standard image. Again, I keep hammering that. Hammer, hammer, hammer. Standard image. Print it. Look at it. The other image, the one that I love, really has some everyday shots included in the scientific portion of the design of that image. So look at those two. Do they look normal to you? Does it look like your sunsets? Does it look like your fall shots of trees? You see what I mean? You look at those and see if you see anything on it. And then you go back to the scientific portions of that image and examine them for lack of neutrality, for banding, for posterization that may occur. All of these things that can happen. Printers may not be capable. If you have a three-color printer, yellow, magenta, cyan, with just one pigment black meant for only plain paper, you're not going to be able to produce a super high-quality photographic print. Yeah, it'll be great for all your downloads from the Internet, you know, recipes, documents, text, that kind of thing. It'll work just fine, but not for photo printing. You cannot compete with something like the Pro 1000. 12 channels when you only have four. It's just impossible. Imagine if you had just three color pencils to paint a painting with. Some people can do it. Some people can do it if you know color, you know, science, how colors are mixed. But, you know, most printers would not be able to produce the same quality match on a four color printer compared to, you know, something higher like a Pro 1000. So now, you realize I gotta I gotta calibrate my monitor because that's my second standard that I use. Really, your primary standard at this point. Some people may go further and calibrate their camera, create a camera calibration profile for that particular condition that you shot under, and then use that to recalibrate or to correct all of those images that you shot under those exact conditions. You change conditions, you got to do a second profile for that new new condition change. In other words, you went from sunny to, you know, under the shade of a mountain, and now you're being illuminated by a blue sky. Your lighting just changed. You need to create a new one. But anyway, you can go that far. And it's a little bit beyond most of us uh, folks. We will not go that far. But really, when you shoot your images, what are you going to do? You're going to edit them. And you have to realize that what you are seeing is a faithful representation of what the camera produced. Okay, so that's that's how we determine whether to edit or not to edit, to be or not to be, right? <laughs> that is the question. Anyway, so our device that we use to visualize our images that we took so much care in, you know, composing and waiting for just the right moment, click, and on our little screen or our camera, we see that, yeah, that looks pretty good, but I can improve on that. You get in your monitor on your editing application, and you look at them, and you go, okay, this is perfect. Boy, you just hit it out of the park. You're out of the park. You hit a home run, but it may not. It may not. So you may want to crop something that you didn't realize you included, you know, you could, of course, you know, set your cropping to maintain that two to three ratio or whatever, unless you're a real, you know, if you're a real purist, I'm not. I crop whatever I need. I don't care about the ratio that I end up with. I'll deal with that. I'll deal with that later. So I'm relying on this, this device in front of me to show me what I shot and show it to me as correctly as possible. And that way I have total confidence that when I make a slight change, the printer is going to be able to display that change. Okay. So when I come back and show it to myself next to my monitor, it pretty much matches. Okay. It's not going to ever match perfectly unless all the planets align correctly. It's really, it's just two different systems we're dealing with. And we've, we've talked about that before. So again, monitor calibration. So how do, you, how do you achieve that? Well, we talked about the Color Monkey or the i1 Studio 
or any of the uh, X-Rite. And uh, where's my little baby from? Ah, right here. This little puppy right here. From that color, we can use any of these devices to bring our monitor to some sort of standard condition. Okay, and by that I mean that it linearizes the tonality from the from black RGB all the way to white. Okay, so R, G, and B look like R, G, and B all the way across from black, getting lighter, 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 all the way to white. And the same thing with all the other two colors. That means that it's now basically linearized. Then it's going to go through a series of... Um, Basically, like black and white, let's just call it that, calibrations, black, grays, all the way to white, make sure that they remain neutral as they are being made lighter and lighter and lighter. So you got a, pretty much a straight line, well, as straight as can be, of a neutrally linear result. That way, when you look at any gray that is 555 five, five, or 20, 20, 20, or 100, 100, 100, on Photoshop, it will look neutral, regardless of whether it is dark or middle or highlight or white. It's going to be neutral. That's it. That's it. That's what you need to achieve. A neutral condition and then at the correct light density. Okay. If it's too bright, you're going to have a tendency to darken your images so that they look correct in that monitor. And you have no clue the monitor is actually showing them to you too bright. So you're really darkening them a little bit. The histogram in Photoshop and other editing applications helps you a little bit because it shows you as you're shifting your total global image a little bit darker, it's going to show you that you are now kind of bordering on being too dark. And often than not, that's what you're sending to your printer. And the printer, of course, produces what you send it as long as you did what verified it with that control image okay now assuming your monitor is calibrated your output almost matches now you're happy and all of a sudden color changes like you know this week it was okay and next week i come back i do a cleaning cycle do a nozzle check everything is perfect and then i print the same image and it's slightly different so something changed. What could it, what could it be? Um, did my calibration shift? Did it, did it change on me? Probably not. More than likely not. Unless there was a sudden um, update of the operating system or something like that. Maybe, maybe it reverted back to the old calibration. And you would have to check that. You would have to check that. But more than likely, that's not going to happen. It has not happened to me. And I've been updating for several years okay so what could it be well did you change your inks hmm, everybody is refilling right did you change your inks and what kind of printer do you have one that would show an instant change like a pro 10 like a pro 100 okay like any epson printer that has cartridges that ride on the print head they actually move you see them moving those types of systems allow you to then basically do a cleaning cycle after you install an, a new ink set and make that ink set immediately available to the printhead. Whereas a R3000 does not. It takes weeks, maybe months to get to the printhead to the point where you are actually 100% on that new ink. So if that new ink was going to present to you a slightly different color output, it's going to take forever. Pro 1000, forget about it. It's going to take forever. You know, Pro 800, the same thing. It's going to take forever. Pro 1, the same thing. So you really do not see the change. You switch to another ink set, even if you switch all the cartridges at once. No change. And you are just tickled pink that those inks that cost only a fourth of what OEM costs are producing the same output. Yeah, that's because you're still printing with OEM inks, you see. So it takes a while. So it may be inks that you switched. It may be something else we're going to talk about as well. But anyway, just be aware that 
if you have a stationary cartridge printer like this, like this, and like this, it's going to take forever. If you have if you have one that uses cartridges that write on the printhead like these, it's going to be instant. Okay, you're going to instantly see it. Let's include this one as well. Pro One cartridges. Yeah, so that's one possible reason for a sudden change in output. Um, color management, basically double profiling in this case, or just like I did, you know, years ago, I had no clue what I was doing. So I was like the most inconsistent fo you know, person in the world. Uh, I, and I thought I was too smart to learn. So yeah, paper double profiling. So what happens? You have two orchestra conductors. One is conducting the orchestra, and then another one comes in and says, wait, well, no, 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 no. I don't like the way you're conducting. Let me speed it up a little bit. No, 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 no. I want to slow it down. Yeah. Two conductors cannot conduct the same orchestra at the same time. Two entities cannot control color output at the same time. So like we discussed early, earlier, verifying your printer with a standard image, you only use the driver initially okay initially and you turn your application you tell it to let the driver control color okay that way the application goes no control i'm just going to send the image to you and you handle it you know what profile you need to use for whatever paper you are using okay good luck now if you want the application to control color, because why? Why would you want to do that? Oh, you're using a custom profile, one that the driver may not recognize or be able to load automatically. So you may tell the application when you go to file print and it opens up that print module, the user interface for printing, you tell it, Photoshop controls color. You tell QImage to control color. Now you're going to have access to ICC profiles. You would then find your profile that you created, choose it, relative colorimetric, you know, pro, uh, pro luster, okay? If that's what you use to create that custom profile, you have to match it to the original paper you chose. And then you got to go to the driver and say, hey, color slash intensity manual adjustment matching no, no ICM, none. You choose none. That way now the driver goes, all right, Photoshop, go ahead and control color through that custom profile. I will just set the printer to recognize what Perluster's requirements are for head gap, ink density application, whether to use Chrome Optimizer or not that type of thing so it will then handle the physical needs of that paper but nothing to do with color management one or the other not both you don't want two chefs cooking the same egg at the same time okay the same thing with printing you don't want either entity to stick their fingers into color management at the same time it's one or the other if you use q image here i go See, pushing it. But why? Because it works. If you use Q image, it will not let you, whether you want to or not, you cannot double profile. It will not allow you to do that and automatically sets your color management on your Canon printer or Epson printer or Photoshop or Q image or Lightroom or whatever you use. Okay. It will automatically set it for you. And so that is one way to at least avoid the possibility of double profiling. What happens? Double profiling. You, you get a weird color shift. I used to get like a, a much deeper version of the image. Okay. It just did not look correct. Okay. It wasn't like it would turn green or magenta all of a sudden. It just didn't look right. And then I would realize, oh, shoot. Yes, I double profile. That was me. My fault. Paper mismatch. 
okay, where you choose, say, a, a luster paper, but you're using a matte paper profile. Well, that is pretty obvious. That's not going to work. Again, it's not going to manifest itself as a gigantic color shift. It's just going to look off. It's going to look a little odd. You could do um, uh, soft proofing, and it will give you pretty much an instant kind of view of what your output is going to be like. You'll be able to see it. You can't miss it. It's pretty obvious. So you can do that as well. Now, here's one that happens even to me. Okay. And you might say, oh, Jose, how can you possibly make any mistakes? You've been at this for decades. Yeah. Well, um, I am not mistake proof. Okay. So not too long ago, I wanted to print something on my PA100 and uh, realized that I hadn't used that PA100 for a while. And so I went ahead and printed it anyway. So I started off just basically doing a couple of um, standard images. I wanted to see if I had to if I had to do a, a cleaning. And the reason I, I did not do just a nozzle check is because I had a roll of paper loaded and I didn't want to deal with printing and also check on my expensive paper. You know what I mean. So I began to print and I began to get this lovely result. So this is a standard image. These are the two standard images that I showed you earlier. And you see what's missing immediately. I had no black. And this is um, semi-gloss paper or luster paper. So I was using photo black and I had no photo black hardly at all flowing. You can see right here, let me find an area where it would really be obvious. Oh, yeah. You can look at the band here. It looks like a bullet. It looks like this and, and lighter on the edges. I had no black here. Look at that. That's supposed to be black. Now, all of the other grays are composited. They don't use black. Black is only used right about that point, and it's gone. My black is gone. I go, oh, gosh, how dumb can I be? So I removed the roll, ran a nozzle check. Indeed, I was missing out maybe, maybe two-thirds of my black channel. Cleaning cycle. Recheck. Nozzle check. Well, after a couple of cleaning cycles, everything was restored. And I got perfect results. So... Most people, including myself, would would continue printing in the hope that it would go away, and it's just not going to go away. That change, luckily for me, it was only black. Had it been a color that was being partly blocked by either air in the dampers or a physical clog, then I would have had a color shift. See, this only manifests itself where black is brought into play, which is only to accent your deepest tones. Did you know that black is not used to create all your grays? No, it's not. It's only used to accent your deepest tones. Like if you go from zero to around six, that's where black comes into play because basically just, you know, compositing the other colors does not produce a strong enough dark, dark gray to pass as black. So you got to use black and all, you know, it's only it's only used during that condition. All right. So I had I had um, a clog, period. And so that gave me this weird output. And again, it took some thinking, you know, super smart Joe, right? It took me a while to figure out, oh, gee, it's just a clog. It's just my black channel. I thought something went haywire with my color management. Inconsistent workflow. And that is the key to a lot of the problems where you really don't keep track of what it is you did yesterday. How did you set this up? If you're a beginner, you have no idea what any of this jargon is anyway. And I didn't. I had no clue. I kept hearing something about profiles and ICC this and ICM that and whatever. And I, what the heck are you, you know, you're all talking about? And I kept just, Printing, 
straight through the driver with S, you know, Epson S, sRGB and Adobe RGB, and it would look this way with this setting, that way with that setting, and I would switch this, and I would switch that, and then I would switch two settings and three settings at the same inconsistency. I had no clue where I was an hour ago. Okay, I didn't really know. Then came Q image, and Q image allowed me to be able to at least go back in my history and see what it is that I set because it would show me what my settings were. The four jobs. So I'm jumping around all this different, all kinds of setting combinations to the point where it's 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 a waste of time. You can't keep track. I could go back and check. Well, what did I what this print was two jobs ago? Two jobs ago. Okay, click on that. Oh, I set this this way or I set that that way, whatever. It would it would allow me to be able to go back and check something I forgot because I did not write it down. I did not take notes and see what it is that I did wrong. And to this day, that is one of the big reasons I use QImage because it simply remembers my mistakes, <laughs> if you will. So it's really, really important to keep a very constant workflow. Listen, if you cook an egg at setting number five for two minutes and it's perfect, and every time you use those settings, as long as the eggs came out of the same hen, <laughs> they will be perfect eggs. If you declare that that egg, you know, cooked in those particular settings to be perfect to begin with, it may not work when you get a huge egg. It may not work when you get a smaller egg. And that will apply to different, say, different papers, different inks. The minute you introduce an unknown, you basically have to start all over again and create a set of settings that will then produce what you want to see. And what is it that we all want to see? A reasonable match to what we see on our monitor. This is our baby right here. This is what controls everything. So if you can you know, get that monitor output to be represented in paper, which is really difficult because paper has lousy reflectivity, okay? It's not bright and friendly. I don't care how bright or how dark this room gets. My output is pretty much the same all the time, okay? It will, it will always look good. It will always look presentable, let's just say. So that is about it. There may be others, maybe others, um, but basically that's what I would go ahead and uh, try to explore, I, you know, when I see something happening that's weird. And um, pretty much that covers it. OS updates, that could be a culprit as well. Sometimes um, updating to a brand new OS, especially not necessarily much in Windows because they do incremental uh, uh, updates, but Mac has like complete different OSs named differently and you update and then something happens because it reverts back to some earlier setting or original setting or default setting. You just got to go back and maybe reinstall a driver, maybe reinstall uh, firmware on your printer or update your firmware. Maybe Epson realizes that, you know, oh, this OS was updated. Let's go ahead and make it, make sure it's compatible. And they, they also need to do that with Windows. I had a problem with Windows as well, where I, after a huge update, my Pro 1000, even though it was recognized, even though it was seen, even though I could access everything on my computer, it would only print about that much and then give up, stop printing and just sit there and do this. The printer would just sit there and do this. I had to uninstall it and reinstall it and everything was fine after that. And you gotta manually go to Canon or Epson and then download whatever the latest uh, driver is, reinstall everything. And the way that they running it is pretty good, pretty much automatically it detects your OS and tells you, it shows you the actual driver you should be downloading. All right, let's take a break and go back to our audience here and see if anything else has been added. Again, folks, don't let me just control the talk here. Please um, ask away anything that may be um, affecting you um, with your printing.
Roger Jones, Happy New Year. I'm here from Portland, Oregon, where the snow is changing to rain. Snow <gasps> in Oregon? Really? Hmm. I guess some parts. But I didn't know Portland was a snowy uh, city. I know it's rainy. I think I uh, missed somebody here. Hang on. Okay, so, yeah, I got gotcha. you. Pepe says, thank you. Nathaniel Booth, another day, like-minded people. Jose has helped me, help us all improve our knowledge and printing. Thank you so much. Nathaniel, I hope you are having a wonderful uh, New Year's in Baltimore, Maryland. Beautiful. Frank Follows from Cold Lake, Al Albert, Canada. Where is that at? I have never heard of that one. But anyway, welcome. I don't think you have been here before. I think I remember names pretty well. You seem like a new uh, visitor. Hope you enjoy the show. Patrick Muse. Hello, Mr. Rodriguez and, and the viewers. I am from Montreal, Canada. I'm interested in the workforce 7710 or 20 just for heat transfer paper images. Great Sunday diffusion. All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you're talking about like iron on type transfer. Um, that works. That works on, say, regular cotton shirts, things like that. If that is what you are trying to achieve, um, it's not as long lasting as, as real uh, sublimation is, but um, it does work for quickies and things like that. I've done some of that to make little, you know, little t shirts to my grandson when he was little. He used to love choo-choo trains, so I would find steam train photos and make them a quick T-shirt. I have a, a couple of heat presses, so it's a lot even more even than using a an iron that you can you can't really um, set to a proper correct temperature unless you use a temperature uh, thermometer that you can shoot a beam at it and make sure that it is at 400 degrees or anything something close to that. Um, but yeah. Uh, those printers, I uh, believe, are are they dye-based printers or pigment? I'm not so much into the Workforce series, especially that size Workforce. I have an old Workforce 1100 here. It's kind of old. It's an old model that I have converted to sublimation, and we make we make uh, mugs such as these, and there's a choo-choo train. That was for my grandson, but he said, maybe you should have it, Grandpa. I said, okay, buddy, I will use it. Patrick says, but change my mind for an eco tank. Yeah, eco tank is wonderful. Eco tank is definitely wonderful for um, what you are trying to achieve. You really do not need anything as as fancy as an eighty five fifty. You can go to a lower one with just you know a, a smaller set of uh, cartridges and um, stick with OEM. They're not that expensive. Only about like they for the eighty five fifty is about eighteen dollars for 70 ml of ink, which is ridiculous. That's almost the same price as third-party inks, just by a couple of dollars difference. Stephen Paul Boy, hi everybody, very healthy, happy New Year's, Toronto, Canada, with three printers, Eco Tank 7750, Eco Tank 8550. I gave up on the Epson large format printer, so I purchased a one-year-old today HP 24-inch Z. Oh, you got a Z900. What is it? Yeah. Those are awesome. And still good. And the printheads are replaceable, by the way. So it's, it's awesome. It'll at, last a long time. Henry Stoffel, Medford, Massachusetts, Epson P800, QMH Ultimate, and OEM Inks. Uncle Jerry says, I have a very old 1280. Wow. Holy cow. That's like, I had one of those at work. I had the um, the seven, the 880 or the 780, uh, the 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 letter size version of it. Yeah, I, those cartridges were something, huh? It was two cartridges, one black, and then one was. Um, five different partitions within the cartridge. It was a rather fat cartridge, about that big around. And it had five channels built in. 
Yeah, awesome. Produced really great output, but if I remember correctly back then, the papers that were available were not really compatible with it, and they would be very uh, subject to fading from ozone. Stephen Polboy says, want to put a picture, but tile it, divide into 16 squares, four across and four down. So four by four, print 16 squares, 16 by 20 to get one picture, 70, 64 by 80. Do you know a program that will tile? I think QImage can handle that now. I'm not absolutely sure, but you could use, you know, Photoshop and just sort of bake, basically break it down, make your layers, and go on from there. I know, um, are you going to have, because most of the time that people tile, they'll leave a little gap, which is something you have to literally crop off so that it makes sense when you join it with that gap. All of these pieces. I've seen, I've seen this done where they forgot to do the cropping of the image. So you have things that just don't line up because you you created that gap. Um, but yeah, I think QImage can handle that now. John Mangi Mangiaracina. Mangiaracina. That's a that's a good apellido. Wow. Hola, prospero año nuevo. That means Happy New Year and uh, 2022 and prosperous New Year. Thanks for all you do for all newbies. Canapro 100, Prescott Valley, Arizona, sunny and 30 degrees. Ooh, that's going to be um, a little chilly out there. My um, in-laws are heading out to um, Arizona for the winter, actually, from Wisconsin. That saves them a lot of work. No snow shoveling. They live in a community where they handle that anyway, but still, it's just not having to deal with snow in the winter. And they said this was going to be, that last year was going to be the last year they did that. But they're going back, so must be working out for them. I, I really am happy for them. All right, continue asking questions. We're going to go ahead and hit the next subject. We've been on for about an hour and eight minutes, so we're moving along just fine. We only got like five more topics to deal with, so keep me busy please. Otherwise, we'll have to cut the chat a little bit short today. I wanted to talk about, you know, let me see. Hold on. Hold on. I remember I had something here. And I want to post this over here. I want to post this over here on top of Richard's image. So this was posted just recently. We had a nice long discussion. And this has to do with migration from, you know, like third party to, uh, from OEM to third party. Which happens to be the next subject. All right. So the photo was taken with a phone. So disregard the fact that the, you know, the color balance is just horrific. Um, this, you know, cyan, everything looks cyan to me. So apparently this is the original output through, uh, OEM inks. And then this is the new output through PC SE inks for the pro 10. Now remember PC SE inks utilizes OEM red because there is no third party equivalent formulation of red ink that can match the density, the, let's just call it the redness of the true OEM red ink for the Pro 10. Pro 10 uses red, remember that, okay? So wanted to know why. So I went through all the, you know, back and forth. And this is what happens when people post something and they don't give, or they're very vague in the amount of information that they provide. If you want, um, help you need to give what you may believe to be too much info okay too much info tmy give too much info give go beyond that if you will because that will that will allow anyone who's able to help you who has the knowledge to decipher what might be going on to help you otherwise we're going to go back and forth back and forth like we did here 
So it turns out, apparently, it required a firmware update because they claim that this, although I doubt that was really truly the case, they claim that this began to show up. This one. Look at the difference here. Something else is going on, right? Maybe this is just bad lighting. Look how light this area is. How light this area. I think it's just the, the illumination. They probably used the, the light from the camera, from the phone, you know, which, of course, folks, if you want to get help, something similar to this, use something else. Do not photograph with a phone. Make sure your lighting is even. Make sure your phone light or flash is turned off because then this tells me nothing. I cannot decipher what was going on until she told me, oh, I shot that with my phone. I went, ah, and your color balance is horrible anyway. So how can I tell you what might be going on here? So apparently there's a difference in density. Well, the Pro 10 ink set from Precision Colors it's about as close as you can get, okay? I'll tell you that. That's the gospel truth. It's about as close as you can get to OEM. But it's not perfect, okay? So you want OEM results? Then use OEM. Pay $16, $17, $18 per cartridge. You're good to go. OEM, right here. I fill these with OEM inks for that very purpose. I have access to Precision Colors SE for that? Of course I do. But I chose to use OEM because it will allow me to maintain my output without having to rely on custom profiles, okay? Especially for branded papers and media for a Canon printer, such as the Pro 10. What if I don't want to? What if I want to use, you know, Precision Colors SE inks for it because they're cheaper, lower cost. Well, now I have to make custom profiles. It's not a perfect match, but it's an acceptable match. If I never show you OEM and I show you a print of, you know, a landscape or whatever that the case might be, or even the standard image, you might look at it and go, wow, that looks neutral. You don't realize it's a little bit darker. And that can be immediately fixed with a custom profile. That is why in their tab for the Pro 10 ink set, the Canon, then uh, what is it? Eight, eight colors? No, it's a 10. Yeah, 10 color ink set. And then you go to the ICC profiles, custom ICC profiles. Download a custom ICC profile he created for those inks for that printer on a numerous paper list, okay? And so download, if you happen to be using one of those papers, you can download that profile, download the D50, Delta 50 profile, and use that to print with. If you know how to use profiles correctly, remember, do not double profile, okay? Make sure that you are using QImage so you do not double profile. It will keep you from doing that. So do that. And you will then solve the slight darkening. You know, it's just a little bit darker result that you get when you use the PCSE inks with, say, Canon paper using the same Canon profile that was made for OEM. OEM prints a little bit lighter. Precision Colors SC, apparently in that condition, her condition, printed a little bit darker. It wasn't that it wasn't neutral. It was just, although her shots are cyan, but you know what I mean. It was actually neutral, just a bit darker. And how did how did this, she discover this? Because she made one mistake. She converted each card one by one, okay, to PC ink. So, when the cartridge goes empty, one of these goes empty, there's still a bit of ink left. So when you add the precision colors ink, you're going to mix it slightly with whatever remnant OEM ink was there. So it may, it may take you two refills to get to the point where, yeah, your, your 
your remaining your re remain of of um OEM inks is so minute that it's really mean, meaningless at this point. It takes you two two refills at least. And so I think what she did was she then went to a completely empty cartridge set that she refilled. And that's when you all of a sudden saw the darkness. But now she claims that that does not occur because she updated her firmware. That makes absolutely zero sense to me. So we don't know. But yeah migration from one ink set to the other let's talk about that because it depends on the brand that you buy now i have told you guys basically kind of a little secret about how these inks are distributed in the u.s so when you buy inks from a u.s third-party distributor you're buying the same inks regardless of who you buy from basically unless unless behind our backs they're doing like what pc does where they have um tweak certain blends um they ask for specific or oh, it gets really really technical in in the uh chromatography i guess you can call it uh part of the, this type of chemistry that they work with so unless they are customizing the ink set that they purchase is going to be a generic ink set so pro 10 generic ink set for that that doesn't mean it's bad generic does not mean bad it just means that i'm going to sell the same formulation to this company that i sell to that company and that company okay so when they put their labels on it they're selling the same ink that i produce as a big batch i am the producer so I produce a huge batch of ink, gallons, barrels, and then I bottle it up and I send it to these companies. And that's what they sell you. Unless they are specifically asking for certain blends, certain uh, formulations, if you will. I mean, color-wise. So will you see a change in output? And this is where it gets tricky. Of course you will, eventually. Eventually you will. So either happens, like I said earlier, instantaneously. These cartridges right here give you instant instant feedback. Pro 100, uh, Pro 9000, Epson 1400 series, 15,000 series. The cartridges ride with the printhead. So there's very little space where ink can be stored within the exit port of the cartridge and the exit port of the printhead. There's only a tiny amount of ink inside the printhead at all times. So when you put new cartridges, whether they have different ink on them or not, and you close that lid, it runs that customary purge cycle and you're done now you're printing with that new ink simply that's the way it works if the inks have a drastically different output you will see it instantly okay as long as your settings are consistent and you did the same thing you did prior to switching to those inks then you will see the difference if you are inconsistency then it's going to be a whole you know, it's just it's just a can of worms. You can't make heads or tails of what you're seeing, what you're getting, because you have no clue what you are doing. Okay, that's that was me. That was me back then. Um, if you buy super cheap stuff from eBay, you really have no idea where these inks are coming from, regardless of who you buy from, and you have no idea whether that batch of yellow will be the same batch of yellow a month from now because they sell such high volumes of this. And so they may be buying yellow dye ink from one producer, one lab in China, these distributors, that is. And so you really don't have any consistency of a source, whereas Ink Owl, Ink Republic, PC, uh, Cone Color, all of these companies, they have consistent output of ink and if something happens and they catch it that ink batch is trashed okay 
and they begin again. So you can pretty much have confidence that these companies will sell you a pretty consistent product month after month after month or year after year for that matter, unless they make an improvement. If they see that an ink set needs to be improved in this or that manner, then they will do that. Uh, one such example would be the Pro 100 versus the Pro 200. The inks for the Pro 200 were improved so much by Canon that PC wasn't able to fully reach that quality level. So if you choose to buy PC Pro 200 inks, they're just not going to match the quality that the Pro 200 on its own can produce. Okay, if you have a Pro 100 with PCSE, they come very close to what the Pro 200 is producing right now. That may be a hint that you don't necessarily have to buy a Pro 200 if you already have a Pro 100 with PCSE inks. If it's a Pro 100 with OEM inks, then yeah, it makes sense to get the 200 because you will see the difference in batch in, 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 in color output. He came very close, but not that close, not enough. So Pro 1000, why would you want to take a chance with some cheap inks? You see a lot of these compatible cartridges. Basically what they've done, I don't know whether they actually got a bunch of these empties. And these can be refilled so easily. It's no effort at all. And then packed with good God knows what ink. Um, quite often they don't even have the, the pigment content that real pigment inks have. They'll be mostly dye with a bit of pigment content to, to kind of make it look opaque. You know, when you look at a bottle of pigment ink, it looks opaque rather than transparent. Um, very, very inconsistent uh, batch quality. And I would not use them on my machine. I like my, I love my machine too much for that. So I will make sure that what I feed through that baby is good quality inks. Now, at this point, I'm using pretty much 70% or so OEM. The rest, the black, the grays are third party. Uh, the light magenta, light cyan are third party, but everything else is OEM. Anyway, how do I know that what I am seeing is the result of that third party ink I just installed when it takes months for it to migrate through? And even after it starts to migrate, it's still not 100%. So it's a very gradual change from what used to be good to now basically maybe crappy results. So what do I do if I'm a if I'm a, a US based or Canada based, North American based uh, ink reseller like Precision Colors? I take my time. I do my homework, I do my work, I do my my testing until the cows come home. Okay, 9, 10, 11 months, whatever it takes, back and forth with the laboratories, back and forth. And then I have to test these inks on some printer that will allow instant results. The only option is the Pro 10. So this is how difficult this was. Okay, there's no way in hell he could use the Pro 1000 to test this slight change, this other slight change, and so forth. I got to do it with the Pro 10 as much as I can. Pro 10 doesn't use blue ink, so I can't test that aspect of it. So what he said at the end was, okay, forget it. I'm just giving up. I have maxed out my other colors besides yellow, red, blue, and chroma optimizer. So it was just yellow, red, and blue. So yellow, red, and blue could not be made to match OEM, okay, third-party wise. So he had to then use OEM inks. And where do you get OEM inks in a large enough, you know, volume to be able to sell you, the consumer, these four liquids in OEM form, buying big old cartridges? 
And I don't know whether he got a slightly lower price than I am getting. I get 225 per 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 um cartridge, 700 ml. I think maybe he was getting because he was buying in larger volume of units, maybe less. But still, in order for him to make a dollar per load, a dollar per load, maybe two dollars per load, he has to charge $35 for an 80. 2 ml load of OEM chroma optimizer. Why? Because after thorough testing, the only way to achieve a seamless transition that would go unnoticeable, you would never know, no one would know, at least visually, that something new was now being fed through the printhead. Disregard all of the the mileage it took to reach the printhead. But once it started to make its appearance at the printhead level, it matched. There was no idea, at least visually, you had no idea that now you're using a different ink. Isn't that amazing? No one else has been able to do that, that I know of, okay? No one. Um, cone colors, talk about cone colors. We always talk about PC. Let's talk about someone else. Cone Colors has been around for a long, long time. It's a very large company, as it, comparatively speaking, with just PC and his wife, Mike and his wife. So Cone Colors has a shipping department, all of, you know, a research department, a um, um, troubleshooting department, and all of this stuff. They have a they they run a forum, a help forum for uh, users and so forth. They make lots of inks. Who makes them? A private lab in China. So they contract this lab. The lab cannot be cannot be producing inks for anyone else, at least legally. So those inks are made to a specific, a specific formulation that as close as possible matches Epson OEM inks. So we talk a lot about Canon printers. Let's talk about Epson then. You got a Epson uh, stationary cartridge printer that you want to begin to use third-party inks on, and you do not want to see a change in output. Then you better use cone inks. They are seamless. You will not see a change in output. Simple. And so that means that you can relax, not get excited about, oh my gosh, I just installed um, Chinese cartridges on my Pro 1000, and by golly, the output is identical to OEM. Surprise, you're still using OEM for the next three, four months, depending at the rate that you print. Yeah, it'll take that long before the hammer hits and you realize, oh, oh no. And you can imagine how long it would take you to wash out those junk inks. You could run an emptying procedure and, you know, begin fresh. But, yeah, you, you know you know what I mean. So it, it, it's just transitioning from OEM to any other ink depends on the type of printer and the quality of those inks. You want to be able to maintain at least close to OEM quality. Um, imagine, if you will, having to make constant different, you know, custom profiles as different colors eventually start reaching the printhead. Imagine that. That's crazy. You would have to make, make profiles every month or so, maybe every two weeks, depending how how much you print that's not that's not something i would want to have to do so yeah so be aware that you know transitioning is just something that can occur like that or take quite a while to uh surprise you okay cyh Hello from warm 75 degree Fahrenheit. I wish still and where? Where is this place? You need to share that location. 
because I might want to go there. Still using Epson 1400 with PC inks will replace printer when my printing knowledge increases. That's a good printer. Did you try the, uh, I, I hope you're using the uh, the new inks that he recently, not recently, but I think it was like a year and a half ago uh, produced. They're really good. I still have a 1400 and I really need to get my butt in gear and begin to use it more. Maybe this week I will. Thank you for bringing that up because it's it's a, I have a set of refillables on it that I fill with these new inks and they proved to be really good, really good quality. Art is here. Happy New Year, Mr. R. Thank you, man. Hope you had a wonderful year as well. Everyone, yes. This warm Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay. Yeah. Um, Let's see, Nathaniel Booth says, it's a new year. Don't ever give up. Never, man. Never. Mike says, uh, this is Agnes B. No, I did the... This is Agnes B. No, I did the way you explained in one of your first video. You watch. Um, I don't know what you're referring to. Did Mike say something earlier? Okay, well, keep us, um, please elaborate, okay? Um, that was Agnes. I've been out of the loop a bit. Is PC still on the brink of hanging up his business? And is it getting closer to that time? I hope not. Yeah, I hope so. I hope not as well. The latest that I um, got from him, and this is kind of personal, is his wife is basically in charge of i would i don't want to say all the menial stuff but you know what i mean putting together labels uh, putting orders together packing orders that type of thing and she's suffering from arthritic condition of her hands so she's getting very tired about doing this kind of work and of course the only way to resolve this is possibly um, reevaluate what it is that you offer Okay, and we can talk about that in a bit as well. Ever since I learned about them from you, I've not bought any other third-party company. Yeah, myself, myself included. Lawrence Keeney, I have been following you here for many years. Anytime I have a printer problem or question, I check to see if you have covered the subject. You know what? Let me, let me stop you all right there. I just, the other day, I decided... I had I had a video that I remember uh, shooting way way long ago. Nothing to do with printing. It was a, it was I have a a friend that I work with. And she's a Filipino girl who works in this. Actually, she's a banker now. She was a lab technician, but she is a performer. So she she belongs to this. Um, um, let's call it South um, Pacific type, um, what would you call that? Not hula, but um, Tahitian. It's a Tahitian dance troupe that goes on these cruise ships that do the Pacific tours. And so I went to uh, videotape one of the, her, her troops performances uh, in Arlington, Virginia at a theater there. And I uploaded her video, her performance. And we were talking, we were watching some girl on TV, my wife and I, doing some belly dancing. And I realized, wait a minute, my friend Ellen used to do that. And so I went back and I I, I know that I named it by her, I named the video by her name. So I entered the her name in her um, the church search criteria and I found the video, we watched it. And yeah, she's really good. <laughs> I don't know how she can sh move like that. Anyway, so then I looked at the date and I realized, oh my gosh, this was 10 years ago. So I went back a little further and I realized I found my first video that I uploaded and it was really just a 
like a a, a um, one of those action cam uh, you, like a like a GoPro type camera um, review that I did exactly ten and a half years ago, and I went, "Wow, I've been at this way too long." Then I went forward in time and I I found one of my early printer type videos that I did. And I come to realize, wow, I've been at this way, way too long. So what have I covered? I wonder myself. I've covered just about everything there is to be covered, really. The only things that I have not covered is individual printer reviews. And I'm not a reviewer. I don't do I don't do printer reviews. I use printers to print with. If it happens to be a new model printer, then I will review it because I'm going to put it to use for further demonstrations on how to print. And printing photos, the basics are identical regardless of what printer you're using, as long as it is a printer intended to be used for photo printing, not some three or four color printer that can print photos, but really is not what you call a dedicated photo printer. So rather than search through over 1,700 videos, use my playlist system that I created. There are over 60 playlists. If it's about one particular printer model, you will find a printer, a playlist on that model. Open it up. And there you will find everything related to that printer. So Pro 10, yeah, there's over 60-something videos on just the Pro 10. And I cover everything about it. So if you want to print about, learn how to print on the Pro 10, rather than look at a very basic how-to-print video, go to the Pro 10 playlist and search there. I didn't further break it down because it's impossible. You can't do, really do that. And there's no way to create that. People suggest, oh, do a database. No, I'm not going to do that. There's playlists. Use them. I use them on other people's channels to find specific information that I know they, they produced two years ago. And I go back in their playlist and I locate it. So look at the playlist and search. You will find a video to please you. I guarantee you. And if I, I did not produce it, I doubt that, but every everything about printing, whether it's color management, there's a playlist for color management as well, has been covered already, okay? Your particular problem, unless you don't know how to really diagnose what you are seeing, what could be the probable causes, has been covered. And when you ask me for help, make sure that you include too much info even if it seems like it's not, you know, um, something that is uh, relevant. Let me be the judge of that. I've been around the block too many times, and I know how to I know how to deal with unknowns. But anyway, we, we're going to go back here because Agnes has um, been very kind here, and uh, she's going to elaborate on what has been going on. Then I will go back and uh, cover a couple of these um, topics here. So let me let me hit Lawrence first. Lawrence Kinney. Okay, I got him. I got him already. Okay, so and this one we did. So here is Agnes B. What about the 4100? That's an awesome printer. If you really need that high capacity, you know, that large width capacity, yeah, just as good as a Pro 1000, just bigger has the ability to use up to 700 ml cartridges, will dwarf these. It's like eight of these, okay? And those cartridges can also be refilled, and those cartridges can also be disabled. Mm-hmm. All right. On the first videos of yours, I watched Canon Prixma Pro 10 setup and third-party ink use May 18. Okay, so I think we spoke earlier. The magenta print. Agnes Baylor, Baller, with her, he is is Agnes B with the, with but with the not enough info. Just to clarify, I did the switching of the cartridges. Okay, so we, you're the you're the person that shot the the uh, prints with your phone. Okay, everything was science. So I went like, what in the world is she showing me? 
So the initial OEM, two PCSE, the way you explained in one. On the first video of yours, I watched Canon Pro 10 set up third party inks use. Okay, all right, let's keep going here. I think you repeated that. It is about the magenta tint problem. Okay, of yesterday's Facebook. So I could not tell whether there was a magenta ink problem because the, the image was so cyanish. Okay, I think you're refeeding yourself here. Yeah. Okay, so you uploaded something new to the original post. I'll take a look at that a little bit later. So are you the one that did you update your firmware or something? Because you replied to a suggestion by someone else, if I recall correctly. Let me see here. Let me look at, at Facebook and see if you have indeed replied. Well, there's a few more comments here. Okay, so you, um, yeah, here you are, Agnes. I got gotcha. you. You got it on your um, little photo. You have a cute little doggy from Budapest, Hungary. All right. So go ahead and let me know if you did that um, upgrade of your firmware because someone apparently suggested that to you. But um, the the change from OEM to magenta, to, not magenta, to, to the PCSE inks should not have caused a magenta cast. In my video where I illustrate the differences, there was indeed a little bit of a difference between the two outputs, and I had to resort to custom profiling. So... Have you um, have you downloaded any of his custom profiles? Unless the firmware update solved the problem, because it seems by the report of the other person that he experienced the same thing, and then he updated the firmware, and problem disappeared. So I'm not sure or very clear as to what's happening here. What are the some of the th first things you do when you set up a Canon Pro 1000? That's why I made like an hour-long video. Check it out. Please check it out. Um, first things you do when you set up any, any printer, nozzle check, head alignment. If the nozzle check is perfect, head alignment. If you got a Pro 1000, internal calibration. And then utilize that calibration. Tell inside your panel, the little screen, I show you in my very, very last video, it was a tour of the Pro 1000 panel, all of the settings, all of the choices, what to do, what to choose, what not to choose. Look at that, and you will know exactly what to do. You re-uploaded or the same ones? Uh, I just went back to look, and it's the same one you had a couple of days ago. Okay, so do that, and I, I will, I will, I will keep following you. But um, were you intending to update your firmware? Because I, if I remember, just I just reread it now, and that's what someone has suggested you do. Let me put that back over here. This is your post. We'll go to the bottom. You apparently said, I haven't done the firmware update like Renato suggested. Since I am watching the live stream, I will do as soon as I am here. Okay, awesome. So you do that, and then uh, please get back to me here on facebook and we'll we'll keep an eye on this we'll continue following you okay awesome 
things are often resolved this way, okay? You just have to have a little patience and uh, be glad that you're here with us because we are here to help. Let me reinsert that there. Okay. So, oh, the two girls. Okay. I did not see that. Let me let me see again. Let me let me do a refresh. Oh my, okay. Okay. So this is your monitor. Your upper one is what your display is showing. And this is what you're getting. Of course, you're shooting with your phone. So that's not going to um, be super accurate as far as a match. Um, hmm. Yeah, do that. And um, if you would like, if you don't mind, well, no, I cannot do that for you because I'm running OEM on my Pro 10. I was going to ask you to email me this uh, file, and then I would go ahead and print it on my Pro 10, but I'm running OEM, so that's not going to matter. That's not going to matter much. Well, I don't know what's going on here. Something is going on. It really should not be the inks. I really, I, when I did the, the upgrade, if you will, or downgrade, whichever way you want to look at it, um, I got basically the same level of neutrality, just a little bit darker, a little bit darker results than I was getting with OEM. So it was like, like I decreased the intensity a little bit. Okay. In other words, I made it a little bit denser. I, it did not change. This is a totally different color output. This is this is verging on magenta, like you said. Yeah. So go ahead and do the, uh, once the live stream is done, uh, we will be done around 4. So once we are done, go ahead and uh, perform your upgrade of your firmware. Be careful doing that, please. And uh, remember that uh, upgrading firmware sometimes has a tendency to um, mess up your ability to use third party. Okay, so be be aware of that. But I haven't heard any anybody with a Pro 10 having um, a problem um, refilling later on afterwards. All right. Remember, we're always here. So. I'm always scanning through Facebook on my daily routine. Uh, so I will catch anything new that comes up. All right. So Pro 1000 has a user replaceable maintenance tank, except you can't find them. They're very rare and you can't repack them. Not, not easily anyway. You can reset the chip and get a little bit more extra life out of it but there's a danger that you may begin to overflow internally and you don't want that to happen i got a resetter here for it that actually does reset the chips but unless there's a way for you to drain the ink uh maybe uh you know the waste ink maybe drill a little hole put a plug in it maybe you know i don't know how how to go about doing this just to squeeze some more life out of it when in reality they sell for fifteen dollars, if they were available, and I think the problem is the chips. There are no chips out there for a lot of um, components, electronic components. So that's a problem. Now, recently, I don't know whether um, Rick Johnson is here with us. 
but he found a resetter for the XP15000 maintenance box. He also has chips that he can probably sell, and he has a third-party maintenance box that should work with the XP15000. Now, I currently have the original one installed. So once it is declared full and the printer stops, yeah, Rick is here. And you can chime in if you want, Rick, about what you have. And so once it is full, I'm going to wear, weigh it and then compare the dead empty weight and a full cartridge, at least what the chip says is full. And that could vary, just like the Pro 1000 so-called full condition varies by quite a bit quite a bit like 50 gram differences sometimes so the beauty about these now if, if these can indeed be reset will be identical to this this is a pro 3880 3800 cartridge and used also on the pa 100 these can be reset they can be repacked by removing this grid removing the dirty insides and putting absorbent material you notice this is an absorbent type pad that I buy. They are water um, hydrophilic. In other words, they can accept uh, watery type uh, liquids, water-based liquids, which is ink. And I was looking at this. I was saying, well, what is the point of resetting this unless you can't repack it? Well, you can. If you look at this has tabs, you would get a little screwdriver and very carefully pry off this top. Pro 1000 does not allow you to do that. It's just a single welded unit. And so you would have to literally saw it in half or whatever to be able to get at it. So here's the chip. Now, Rick has a um, source, I guess. I don't know whether he's going to be selling these or not, but he has a source for a third-party type cartridge. And that's probably the first time I've ever heard of a third-party so-called wasting cartridge or box, as they like to call this. But once that one is full, and I'm trying to you know, continue using my XP15000, which I'm in love with, by the way, once that is full, I will be able to pry this off very carefully on the other one, remove the insides, wash it, pack it with anything. It can be cotton. It can be any kind of absorbent padding that will absorb liquid that is water-based. Okay, Pop this back on. And if I have to change the chip, I'll do that. It doesn't, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We're, we're still exploring this. And then once I do that, I can continue printing. I will not have to buy these. These are also quite rare as well, okay? I did manage one to get one from Epson. Cost me about $15. It took a few weeks to get here, but I did manage to get it. And so that is my spare wheel. That'll be wonderful because there's nothing worse for me anyway. I'm kind of a... I'm not a crazy tree hugger, but I do, I do kind of, you know, I'm pretty good recycling. And so I, I think that's important to do this day and age. I don't like to see this big gigantic cartridges being thrown in the trash, saturated with with you know a ton of ink, nasty stuff. If I can clean them, if I can repack them, I don't have to throw this unit that will last thousands of years out there. Okay, in some landfill. If we exist thousands of years from now, our archaeologists will be finding these stupid things in these landfills. So reusing these, I don't know why these companies don't allow you to do that readily. I just don't. It would really help. help. Um, so having said that, if the XP15000 can be these things, the, the wasting uh, boxes can be reset and reliably reset and then reused. That solves that problem, okay? 
I know, I know. Epson won't be making their $15 a unit anymore. Oh, well. Now, Rick is going to be letting me. He sent me an email just recently with a bunch of information. So I will uh, be in contact with him. The Heart MBA, do you have a video on how to choose paper? Yes, I do. And uh, basically, you um, buy, um, if you're in Texas, Red River, Dallas area, buy their sample packs. Choosing papers is not a science. It's psychological. What you love, I probably will not or may not. What I love you probably may not love the combination of image type style editing style to a paper type whether it is smooth as a baby's bottom super glossy medium glossy luster slightly texture uh, roughly texture matte warm base cold base cool base neutral base everything the weight, the thickness, it's all up to you. So there is no science to this. That's why I've only made a couple of videos about that subject where you cover how to kind of arrive at, in other words, how to create a relationship, an emotional relationship between you, the photographer and printer, and a particular set of papers, maybe two or three. I don't, I don't really, I have dozens and dozens of different papers. I do. I only like two or three. Okay. For glossing, this is my favorite. A sub. I'm going to be making a print of those leaves in a bit. But yeah. So why should, if I love that glossing, in the way that it looks is what I printed that standard image on. This thing is luscious. Look at this. It's got nice weight. It, it, it really feels good to the touch. And with a custom profile, you just cannot beat it. XP 15,000 PC inks. Okay. Not OEM. PC. So... Something like a mm, mm -hmm. portrait of a baby, not super sharp, tack sharp rendition, a little bit fuzzy, very pastel. Since it doesn't have a ton of detail, you don't need a glossy paper. You can use a rough watercolor surface type paper. Okay. And with a warm paper base, that baby will look so cuddly. You just want to hug it. You want to hug that print. That paper is not suitable for a F F uh, sixteen fighter jet at a, at an air show. No, 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 no. You need a glossy paper, a metallic paper for that. You see what I mean? A sunset with lots of oranges and yellows and you know reds. You want to use a cold paper, a glossy cold paper? No, use a matte paper. Maybe a neutral base. Maybe a little bit of warm base. You see. So each each paper will then lend itself to each type of image and what strikes you as a match you will know believe me you will know when you have a match so buy your packs your sample packs i don't care what company you choose you're in dallas or i mean in texas red river yeah they're 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 constantly having sales they have their their uh, sample packs available all the time you have art paper sample packs you have regular photo paper sample packs you have this and that and blah, blah blah all kinds of sample packs and you get paper a lot cheaper that way okay for you to test choose one or two maybe three at most that really lends itself to the type of photography that you produce the video that i did a long time ago i did because it's, it's the same subject whether it's 20 years ago or 10 years from now, it'll be the same criteria. There's no difference in how to choose a paper. I don't know what kind of medias we will have in 10 years, but you use the same process of elimination. Okay, this image looks really good on this paper, but it looks crappy on that paper. You know, this crappy paper 
kind of a luster resin coated. I would not use that for a sumptuous landscape. No, I would use a matte, smooth, maybe a satin, not satin, but um, what are they called? Velvet, velvet, Epsom velvet, something. I forget what it is. It is just, if it feels like you're using cotton gloves. That's how it feels. It's almost fuzzy to the touch. And it just makes that landscape look fantastic. Not that paper. That will not work. Okay. At least for me. So it's a matter of you finding what paper will work. Or oh, you're in Dallas. Okay. There you go. There you go. Even better. You'll get it that much quicker. <laughs> All right. So. Rick Johnson says, resetters, maintenance boxes, and maintenance chips for XP15000 and ET5550. Do they use the same one, or are they different different boxes? Are they the same for the two printers? I'm going to, is that on your store right now? Do you have that available? I may just go ahead and hit you, hit you for one set. I'm going to have to check that. Let's see. Hang on. Hang on, folks. Do not go away. Let me look at, let me find uh, Rick's link. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, here we go. We're going to go ahead and I love I love doing this because it really helps our members here. Okay. I think this is you. You tell me if I'm wrong. This is your store, right? And there's your resetter. Is that yours? Is that what you're selling? Yeah, that's got to be it, right? So I will hit that a little bit later. So you, I don't see the um, 15,000 listed here. Okay, so you you are you've expanded quite a bit. I'm going to leave this uh, minimized. I'm going to go ahead and look at uh, this a little bit later. All right. Awesome. I'll bring this back over here. We'll hide it here for a minute. So yeah. Okay, you answered no, and then yes. C3661 is what? What is this? And then you have yes, and you have yes. Okay, that's probably answering my question whether that was your store or not. So which one of those is the one that resetted for the XP15000 box? Or... Or if you are selling already the um, compatible boxes and the chips, that I need to know. So I, I, I need to acquire one of those as well because I'm going to come up with a method of repacking these. Okay. Xperia. Is that, did you mean to write that? Hold on, I got another Joe Bowen HP Design Jet 130NR has, that has been in air-conditioned storage for 10 years 
Any recommendation to try and put back in operation? Oh, gosh. No, no clue. 10 years. Now, you got to tell me. You got to tell me whether those cartridges have built-in printheads or not. Some of the HP printers, and I'm not familiar with any HP model, uh, but if it's 10 years old, they may have built-in cartridges like these. These are similar style. Okay, they come with a printhead. This here is the printhead. Okay, you use it once and you throw it away. So when you replace the cartridge, you replace the printhead. So if that is the case, if that is the case, if you go back and look at those cartridges and you see something similar to this, okay, where you can take the unit out, it does not look like this. It does not look like that, where there's nothing. It's just a port for ink to come out, and that then sits inside a printhead itself. But if it's like this, and you remove it, and you see this underneath, then it's a matter of just buying a new cartridge, and it will revive. Oh, they have separate printheads, but are they attached to the cartridges? Or is it a printhead, and then you install a cartridge onto that printhead? And are the printheads replaceable? You may not find something for something that old, though. That's the problem. All I can tell you is new inks, if you can even find them, and then test it. Test it and see what happens. The worst that can happen is you got a clogged printhead. I mean, that's not very um, surprising after 10 years in a very dry environment to boot, right? All right. So I think it's a great idea to be able to reuse those um, units. Rick says, I have research for the XP15000 now and coming soon for the ET8550. So yeah, you know, I am about that close. Um, PC just sent me a nice Christmas present, which would put me about 40% into the um, cost of purchasing an 8550. Um, he gives me an Amazon gift card every year for all of the help that I provide him. So I may go ahead and jump at that if I can find one, say, you know, on Amazon. <laughs> No separate inks and heads. Probably go for a new 8550. I don't know what you mean by no separate inks and heads. Do you mean, like I said, old HP cartridges had built-in printheads. So when you use a cartridge up, you throw it away. You throw away the printhead and begin with a brand new one because it comes integrated into the cartridge the ink cartridge itself that's the same thing with this lexmark these are used on a lot of the primera disc printers and so once you exchange this for a new one you are basically printing with a brand new printhead okay i just want to make sure so that i don't order the wrong thing from you all right People who print borderless, and I don't know what the excitement is with printing borderless. I don't I don't want to insult anyone, but it just looks cheap to me. It really does. Um, borderless came about when these one-hour drugstore type, or even cameras, when camera stores existed back in the days. Uh, there were several, several of them around my area here. You can go and have your roll of film developed and printed pretty much in an hour. You go out, have some lunch, do a little shopping, come back, and your prints are ready. And they would be four by six, borderless, because 35 millimeter film is two to three ratio. So they would just print everything borderless. That means you crop some of the image out and you get a nice edge to edge result on a roll chop 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 and you got your little stack of borderless prints in one hour from your film 
And so when inkjet printing came into play, people remember that. They loved that borderless little four by sixes. So they demanded that functionality. In order to provide you with that, okay, you have to set up the driver to, and also mechanically set up your printer uh, platen. That's where the printer passes back and forth. Take a look inside your printer. You will see a metallic, like chrome shaped, silver plated, um, not real silver, you know what I mean, silver colored plated strip of metal. And it has sponges, little foam rubber, little patches here and there. And so those are there to catch what? The overspray of ink. Imagine having to print over the beyond the edge of your paper. Who in their right mind would want to do that? Okay. Who in their right mind would want to get a spray can and spray a board and go beyond the edges and spray your floor with it? That's what the printer is doing when it's printing borderless. It is printing beyond the edges. Now, if the image is kept exactly the same as the paper, uh, how are you going to position that exactly to the, to the micron so that it exactly matches four by six image dimensionally over, perfectly printed over a four by six piece of paper, which may not be four by six anyway. It may be slightly off. You really can't trust these cutting machines, okay? So that can happen you will get multiple different types of little borders because there's no way that paper can be positioned every single time perfectly in perfect register with the digital four by six inch image. It, it's going to be shifted. It's going to be grabbed out of different positions slightly every single time. So in order to avoid these irregularities of all of these little borders appearing, oh, and you would not have to print beyond the edges either but people don't want that people want that perfectly perfect edge no white sliver so we need to enlarge the image that's where you that's where you open up the pandora's box okay that's when it happens the can of worms because now you need to enlarge the image a certain percentage five percent and if you're a purist and you spend so much effort basically perfectly you know <laughs> shooting that 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 shot so that you can print it exactly as the digital file you will lose part of the image and you will not be happy so now not only are you cropping your perfectly um, composed that's the word i was trying to come up with image you're now printing beyond the edges and that that ink has to go somewhere it does not perfectly land on those sponges, which are situated only for specific widths of paper. Four. Four by whatever, right? Five. Five by seven, right? Eight. Eight by what? Ten. Eight and a half by 11. Not 11 by 14. There isn't one for 11. And if you have a larger printer, maybe 13. At that point, that's it, or 17, okay? If you make a custom size, it's not covered. There are no little sponges set at those widths to be able to catch overspray on a custom size image. A 12 by, no, there isn't one at the 12 inch width mark. There's no sponge for that. Should they put a sponge? Yeah, they could, but they're not going to. Because really, this is just a pain in the you-know-what for them. So what they do is they, when you choose borderless, you'll get a warning. Tells you, smack in your face, don't do this. Oh, you're going to choose to do this anyway? Here's what can happen. And it tells you about leading edge and trailing edge artifacts. Sometimes they even force you to have, they just don't let you, or they force you to have wide borders, leading and trailing. Okay, especially with fine art papers. So there's a lot of things that can happen. Why do I keep saying leading and trailing edge? Because the transport system does not have a full lockdown 
on the paper when only an inch is sticking out or only an inch is left to be printed okay it just doesn't that paper that's coming out nothing is supporting it finally once you get enough support and you start printing like from this point onward to about here that's when you got your maximum support beyond that you have no support at all the paper is dangling like this and there are no rear rollers keeping some invisible leftover paper down flat there is no way you're going to have this kind of action going on and you'll end up with head strikes where the nozzle plate this baby right here will physically hit the paper surface. See, you maintain a little gap of a few thousands of an inch between the lowest portion of that plate that contains all those little holes. Each little hole is a nozzle, one single nozzle. That distance, if you see it magnified, it would be like a, a big flat thing with lots of holes. They're little spray cans. Psst, psst, psst. And the paper is right here. Okay. If the paper just curls up a couple of hairs, it will hit it. Okay. That's how intricate it is. If the paper buckles, okay, some papers, it, it makes me think they were not even tested by the paper manufacturer. It really makes me think that. Because you run them through, and if you have an area that has a very dark, dense region, well, guess what you need to create a very dense, you know, dense, dark region? Lots of ink. And lots of ink means lots of wetness. And lots of wetness means on a fiber-based paper, not RC-coated, fiber-based paper. Lots of wetness gets absorbed. And guess what the fibers do? They expand. They become engorged. And that little area there may rise up. It may go the opposite way, but it may probably rise up and get scraped by the printhead. Can that happen? Oh, absolutely can. It happens to me quite a bit with certain papers. So you got to be really careful. So you end up, when you print on those papers, you have to end up creating these custom settings where you increase the the head gap between the printhead and the paper, the maximum paper surface it could swell to, depending. If you print very light pastel images with no dark areas, there's no swelling. But if you print other air, other types of prints that have dark areas, you will have some swelling and you will have the probability of the head strike occurring. It'll scrape it like if you took a bunch of little knives and went like this. It's really, really amazing, especially on delicate burrito papers. I had that happen to me with the old Red River, uh, I think it was San Gabriel 1.0. I had a hell of a time with that. I couldn't get it to print. Now, if I printed small prints with it, like with cut, it was a roll. And if I cut some of the sheets down, it wouldn't do it. And that happened on the 3800. That happened on the Pro 1000 as well. So, yeah, printing borderless. Remember, even if you print with borders, quarter inch borders that's too close to the edge okay to give you a, a perfect last half inch of printing it's really too close the technology of, of the paper advance it just doesn't exist to be able to produce perfect support the last inch pre and the last inch post okay so that's why i print with big borders all the time In, I always get great results. I don't get any edge artifacts because I print with big borders, period. You will get paper slippage. It could actually, it could, it could hit the edge and skew the paper. Why? There's nothing holding it. Only those little star wheels is what's holding the paper in place. 
And those little rollers in the front is what is advancing the paper that last inch. So you're going to get artifacts. Do not be surprised if you get banding, you get uh, paper image shifting, actually, like actually skewing. Um, it's just part of the technology. The only way to avoid it is printing on roll. That roll is always being supported. Okay. And then you're going to trim those prints off that roll anyway. And you will not have any kind of problem. But printing on cut sheets and expecting to print edge to edge, that's a gamble. And that's why they give you that warning. They will always provide that warning for you. Indeed. Okay, last week we were going to look at, let's see what time we got. We got about 40-ish minutes. Let's look at the driver a minute for the, um, I think it was the Pro 1000. And I showed you guys earlier another live stream on the P800 black and white or advanced black and white mode. Let's explore Pro 1000 black and white mode. Then we're going to print that that print of the uh, green leaves for my friend. So I'm going to look up the Pro 1000. Right click. I'm going to move that over here right on top of the image. We're going to explore that a little bit. Okay, so we got Pro 1000. This is Windows, of course. So this is what you're going to get. Okay, right click and pick printing preferences. This is the yellow little box that I was telling you about. You click on that, click on matching. We'll see what we have it set at right now. ICM that means that on in the relative color metric that means that if I print on Pro Photo Pro Platinum, it will choose that profile for me. Hey, wait a minute, I can put myself here without any problem. I can get I have the ability to choose any paper I want that is Canon and print with full color management. So if I print on Pro Luster, letter size, manual feed, change that to top feed, high quality, and I click on this, matching, and choose ICM or driver matching for that matter, doesn't matter, and hit OK and apply. I will be printing anytime I load Pro Luster on my Pro 1000 and use this, this setup, I will be printing with a full color managed workflow. Now I have to tell Photoshop to let the driver control color. I have to turn, you know, um, I have to tell uh, Lightroom to let the driver control color. I have to tell QImage to let the driver control color, okay? And that will work perfectly. Now, let's look at black and white mode. So once you pick black and white mode, it, it, it changes things a little bit, okay? And what that does, it will then allow you to print a color image as a black and white. Notice it turned this to a black and white rendition. Color, black and white. Now, if I Click on preview. It's going to give me a preview before I print. Now, this is a little iffy, and it works in a, in a weird way for some people, and some others report no change. But I have had people who get a color shift, a color shift on their results. And when I tell them to just undo that preview, it goes away. True or not, who knows? Okay, that's just one of the things. So that is about it. I can also go to the main here then go to advanced settings and set all kinds of different uh, defaults you can have drying time where it's going to wait let's say you have a, a multiple job in other words two or three copies of the same print you can set this to say 30 seconds it's going to output the first print and then wait 30 seconds before the next one is output. That gives you a chance that the next print that's going to sit on top will not cause any problems. If there's a, a certain degree of moistness, you know, still on that print, you can set it to one minute, up to five minutes. Okay. 
which is always nice. Now, print head height. Remember, these are, let's see, right here, sorry. Avoid paper abrasion. So you can set this here or in the maintenance tab. What that's going to do is going to increase the head height. In case you see any hint, like when you have it on the normal mode, if there's any hint of a head strike or scraping of the surface, you can avoid that by setting it to avoid paper abrasion. Paper vacuum. Do not vacuum. Why would you not want to vacuum hold your paper? That's going to increase the probability of not having any head strike. Decrease. Okay? Because the paper will be held down flatter than it normally would have. Let's just say if it's a slightly uneven paper. Say something you cut off a roll and it has a certain degree of curl. You want to set that on to make sure that it's on. Actually, I also always have it on. Unidirectional printing. That's one direction only. It will take twice as long to print. Sometimes that will solve any kind of a little binding, uh, not banding. Banding you will have even after you do a, a head alignment. It still doesn't go away. And it happens with certain media. It happens with certain portions of your image, like a light blue sky. You could end up having some banding. The reason behind that, no one has been able to tell me why. But if you click on unidirectional printing, it's going to only print in one direction, come back, advance. One direction, come back, advance. It takes twice as long. But it will solve, often will solve that. Calibration value. You calibrated your monitor. Okay, and now you calibrated your printer internally. Please tell it to use that value. Okay, I did it on my on my screen over there. But you should do it here as well. Use value. Why would you want to disregard the value you just created that made your color output match the factory level? All right, makes no sense. Use value. And okay. You see what I mean? There's a lot of goodies here. You need to, you need to really uh, check. Color. What does that say? I cannot read it with my bad eyes. Print quality highest, of course. Color, blah, blah, blah. Intensity, I believe that says. Set it to manual. And now you can adjust that. We're working in black and white. Remember, folks. So you want to enter this mode here and adjust your tonality. Okay, if your print is not quite looking neutral, you want to adjust your tonality here. The same thing here. This is kind of neat to, to look at in print form. Okay. All right. So you're going to adjust your tonality and go away from center. So you want, it's a little magenta. You want to add some green. You see? Opposite. A little green. You want to add some opposite a little this you want to add some of the opposite so you will neutralize always neutralize whatever tone you may see because at first it's not going to be perfect okay it's not going to be perfect you have some custom that was a custom setting if you want to just an overall warm tone see that it immediately shifted over to the right to give you provide you with a warm result black and white that's neutral. Cool tone is going to shift. And notice here, you can see it happening right here. Slightly, very, very faint. That's a little bit warmer. So brightness. If your prints in black and white mode require a little extra brightness, you can adjust that here. You see that you can go way beyond what you would normally go. If they are too light, darken them okay, slightly. And then print again. Contrast. By the way, folks, you are not using color management here, okay? This is a non-color managed system. It will utilize all your colors. It will utilize your blacks, your grays, and some of your colors to arrive at a nice linearly neutral result. But if you have a printer that already produces a linearly neutral, say, standard image, you should be able to print black and white with no problems, no color shifts. This provides you a little bit better uh, shadow detail, actually, as far as I have been able to uh, establish. 
So you just simply pick that paper type, okay? That's it, that's all you have to do. Maintenance, you guys know what the maintenance tab includes. Um, lots of goodies in there as well. All right, let's go ahead and print this baby. I'm gonna open up QImage. I have that file actually sitting on my desktop here. And I want to locate it. We'll see what the um, XP 15,000 can do. When we're done with this, we'll go ahead and um, bid everyone goodbye. Thank them for uh, all the support you guys have given me throughout this year. It's been awesome. I really do appreciate that. Okay, dope. so here we are. Let's jump over here. I have Q image open. Here's the image. Here's some of the colorized um, of a black and white image. I did it using that uh, filter called Neural in Photoshop. You might want to take a look at what that looks like. And that that's something I might print a little bit later as well. But let's remove that. We're going to choose uh, in our driver. I'm going to choose glossy. I think we got it. What printer do I have here? Oh, that's the Pro 1000. Let's switch printers here. And the XP 15000. 11 by 17. And we want to make a custom print that's going to have, I think, yeah, nine and a half wide. We'll load this image. Boom. No worry about the folders. Uh, the, the borders will leave it like that. We just want to make sure that this prints correctly. So I'm going to go ahead and check to see if we are using the custom profile. No, we are not. That means I'm going to have to manually find it. And let's see, San Gabriel, no. Sub A, glossy, right here. So we'll open it. We have this set, by the way, to print in simulator 16-bit mode, which is really cool. Uh, relative colorimetric, black point compensation. All right, let's go ahead and hit print. Remember, this automatically set my driver so that it does not control color. QImage does that. Nothing to worry about. Let's let's check. I I keep forgetting how to um, how to check in the uh, so-called um, where's my driver? My properties right there. I keep forgetting the way that uh, this is handled here. Advanced, no color mat adjustment. You see that? So it automatically said that for me. I didn't even have to think about it, which is awesome. I need that sometimes, by the way, folks. I need a little help. All right, so let's make that a little bit bigger. And we'll go ahead and print it. Don't have to worry about anything. We'll see how that looks, okay, once I get that. It's going to send the job over. You see it's loading up. And you get the little ding ding. And now the printer is waking up. And we'll let it print. And we'll come back when it is done. Again, that combination, this is what I was talking about when somebody asked about how to choose a paper. That combination is just amazing to me. This paper with that printer. Keep an eye on it. There are sometimes one of the things about the XP 15,000, the paper advance is really not perfect. Certain papers, that watercolor uh, radiant white 
a paper from Epson that I sometimes like to use. You you may have to help it a little bit. Okay, I have it. In, I have the printer in a little bit of an awkward position here. It's against my TV right now, and uh, that's causing the rear guy to move a little bit more more vertical than it really should. It should be relaxed to the back a little bit. And that allows the paper to enter at a less acute angle. But yeah, it's just a matter of pushing the little cart out a little bit. I just need it to have it in that position so I can walk back there without knocking something down. And I see it emerging. Like I said, I recently topped off all the cartridges. It took about possibly, let's see, four or five ml of ink per cartridge. They were down to like 22, 23 grams, and I got them up to 27, which is really the max before that excess sponge begins to become saturated. So no problem at all. I threw away this the other day, but this is a this is a um, refillable you can buy, and it's just pure crap. Look at the look at the internal wall contacting that sponge. That's air. That means that sponge does not come into full contact, or something. There's something in there, and so I, I'm gonna eventually throw these out. I just did it. I did it for theatrics. I just threw it in the trash just to show how disgusted I was with this. And they don't come with chips anyway, so you have to run a chipless printer. So apparently what we're looking for here is a proper rendition of these um, greens. And he had trouble doing that. And Maybe I will as well. Who knows? I'll have to see. Of course, it's so dark, I can't even read. So hopefully when I bring it up to the monitor, you will be able to see it in a slightly better brightness condition. Let me open up this a bit more. Yeah, that's bright enough. Let's see. Yeah, that will work. And then we'll uh, use up the last 20 minutes or so just to uh, chit-chat and to do um, some Q&A that you may have. Almost done. And I just love, I just love, love, love the look of this paper. Okay. It's, it kind of surprised me because I hate glossy paper. I really do, but I am loving this paper. And here we are. Oh, almost done. There we go. What do you think? It's not as green as the... Um, so I see what you mean. It's not as green as the uh, rendition on the... Uh, over there that I can see. And I cannot put that together so that it makes any sense. That's a fairly good match. Not too bad. This matches pretty well. But anyway, that's really lovely, man. Really lovely. I don't think this is the high-resolution version, or is it? It looks a little bit... I don't know. It's, it's sharp. Again, I'm trying to visualize this. Pretty much in the dark room but yeah it looks very nice yeah that's very sharp down here as well i love this beautiful i'm going to use this as an example from now on thank you i wanted to show you guys something here let me see if i can do this i can go ahead and close q image up The person that I was dealing with earlier uh, had a 
think it was a Canon 9020, TS9020. Is there such a thing? Anyway, so they sent me this. They were having problems with, was it banding? No, it was a man, a gentleman, with some banding. And I said, well, I need to see a nozzle check. Absolutely. First thing you should do when you have any problem, always run a nozzle check before you do anything. And this is what was sent to me. And I'm going like, what in the world is this? So I immediately see problems with cyan. I didn't see any problems with black. Look, this is this is beautiful. Not a bit of the grid is missing. But what are these, this, this square looking, little square, 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 and this moray type pattern. I don't know what that was. And I said, would you do me a favor and check your cyan and magenta cartridges for Inkflow? Because he decided, this is a printer that he bought used on eBay. And that always, got too many cables on the floor. That is always a crapshoot. You never know what you're going to get. Never buy something used unless you can absolutely check it. Okay. Have someone, whoever's selling that to you, send you a nozzle check. Send you a video of them running the nozzle check right there in place. But often, like with this, it said slightly used. Well, that means to me greatly neglected. <laughs> right? Slightly used may sound good to you, but that truly means incredibly neglected. In other words, that printer sat around not being used. And what happens when you don't use a printer? All kinds of bad things. On top of that, he gets it, and then he runs, realizes, I should say, that he basically had no ink. Well, then, without any other knowledge of what conditions this printer was kept in how do you know the printer works well he began to explore the cost of inks so this is similar to the 8320 that i have okay and this is the kind of nozzle check you should be getting No squares. You see that? There aren't any squares there. Everything looks correct. Okay. This is similar to that one. The, the set of inks is about the same, except this uses, I believe, blue ink. Okay. One of those colors is blue. So we'll go back to this. So we have this, this pattern here that makes no sense. So I said, well, I really don't know what's causing that. So what I want you to do is to remove one of those cartridges and then hold it. Let's just assume that this is the cartridge. And then hold it over a cup of, you don't mind getting dirty, paper cup, a can, whatever. Not one of these, but we'll use this as an example. Hold it. No clip on the bottom. Just, just hold it. Make sure that you have enough ink and then pull the fill plug out and it should drip, 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 drip. About one and a half drips a second, maybe two. If you get that, then you have good ink flow. We can, we can eliminate that possibility of being the cause of this ridiculous look here. I got to point toward the light because it's reversed. And so, you know, what is really causing that? And he says, well, I got no drips at all. I go, oh, crap. That means your cartridge is not flowing ink. How high did you refill that cartridge? Oh, by the way, he's using refillables on the Canon um, 9020. How high did you refill it? And the reason he went with those is just the same reason of the my 8320. The cartridges are simply opaque. You can't really see. You can drill a hole. 
you could you could refill them but eventually you have to then disable the chips just like we're doing with some of our big printers because there are no chips so the only option is to use a refillable cartridge but you got to refill it correctly so he filled it all the way to the top where it was overflowing with ink because he figures the more ink i put in it the more ink i will have to use well that filled the chamber up you know and now you have a locked hydraulically locked ink flow it cannot flow so i told him the only way to do that is to blow into it he did it without getting ink all over himself and now he has ink flow i said please run it on run a cleaning cycle followed by a nozzle check and then send me that nozzle check this is the one he sent me this is the second nozzle check and it still had the same problem as the first one and i'm going like what in the hell is going on here this is not normal this is not normal at all and he didn't know what i was talking about so he didn't really take a good look at the photo that he, the photo of the nozzle check okay so then i suggest well here's what you do now you have ink flowing um by and i you know diverted him over to ebay to a good reputable provider of compatible inks which is what i'm using on my 80 my 8320 by the way this is what produced this perfect nozzle check here okay so i know they're reliable they're compatible but you know it's still good those printers are not really made for gallery quality photos they're made for documents things like that so no no biggie so he says wait a minute so are you saying that if i buy these compatible cartridges it'll be back to normal i said i don't know i don't know but you have to eliminate that it could have been your cartridges that you refilled. So buy this compatible cartridges, remove yours, put clips on them so they don't drain, put the new compatible cartridges in it, one cleaning cycle, one nozzle check, and then print a print to see if you have that banding. It was weird banding, by the way, very irregular. It did not repeat itself print after print. So eliminate the, that it could be your refilled cartridges by installing compatible cartridges that come factory filled they're filled by a machine so you know they're pretty reliable as far as that goes and if that eliminates the problem then it's not your print hit because i thought that weird pattern could only be produced if it's a print hit electronic problem which means that you would have to spend $103. By the way, he paid $200 for the printer use, which is terrible, plus another $103 for a new print head, plus $20 for a set of cartridges. That's already, you know, putting him about $130, $330, and he may have to dump the printer because it could be your logic board causing that problem with that print head. So replacing the print head may not solve the problem. And there's no way for us to diagnose the culprit, whether it is directly from the printhead or directly from the logic board. So he then tells me that he doesn't see that artifact on his actual nozzle check, that he looks closer to mine. And I go, well, the hair is this coming from then? He scanned it. He scanned that nozzle check. And whatever resolution his scanner is set for caused this. It's like a moray pattern. Strange as it may be, that's what caused it because he did not see this pattern. He does not see this on his printed uh, nozzle check. And I go, oh my God, after all this, and we had a phone call together and everything. I said, go ahead and print a little image, just four by six on good glossy paper and see if you have that same banding. Then get back to me. He has not, so I don't know what's going on. But anyway, keep in mind, folks, you're asking for help and we ask you for a nozzle check. Take a good photograph of it, not with a phone 
unless you're really good at taking phone photos, use a camera. Don't scan it because the scanning is going to use a pixel-based sensor. And you're scanning dots. And depending on how that paper is oriented on your flatbed, it's going to cause a weird moray pattern, such as the one that I just showed you. Do I have any hair left? Yeah, I do have a few fuzzies here and there. So I spent a good day and a half. I called PC. I called another person. And PC told me, listen, you're taking too much responsibility for this. I said, listen, dude, I just want to help the guy. I just want to help the guy and, and you know, get him to fix this problem. Had it been me with that problem and I was clueless, I would want some help from someone. So I haven't heard from him. I'm going to email him a little bit later and see whether he was able to solve the problem because he went ahead and ordered those inks anyway. He may not need those inks. He may be able to continue using the refillable cards, which I may go ahead and try for my um, my wife's printer because at least I think I know how to refill them properly and not reach the top and possibly flood my vent. Yeah, you can't do that. All right, so I'm going to explore Rick Johnson's um, offers that he has on his uh uh, eBay store, and uh, I'm, I am thrilled to death to be able to, not this, dummy, this one, to be able to reset these. I got to discuss that with Mike as well, because maybe he should uh, be selling those. And by the way, um, for the person who did ask earlier, um, what, what I suggested that he do is to go back and take a look at everything he's supporting and simply just look at his sales report. Has he sold anything for some of these old or these non-photographic Canon 4 color printers or Epson 4 color printers? What have you sold to support these basically non-photo printers? You want to cut back on your, on your workload. Uh, you want to um, cut back on your inventory. Things that you know very well only sell once a year. There are other companies out there. This is not going to break you. This is not going to make you. Okay. Your sales right now are, are evolve around Canon products, unfortunately. You know, that's about the only brand that still allows us to get away with certain, certain levels of refilling and use of um, so-called um, third-party uh, consumables. Even though the 200 and the 300 from Canon just cannot be reset and that's just for the time being maybe in the future they might be it depends on the how much popularity these printers gain okay the reason the pro 100 pretty much within about a year and a half was able to get a resetter for those cartridges is because it was being given away for free if you bought a camera and you got a free printer it was being sold by people for you know a fourth of the original price because they got the printer for free and they made a few bucks selling it on uh, Craigslist. So the, the the world was flooded, not the world, U.S. was flooded with these Pro 100s. I managed to nab three of them. I got one actively being used right now. It's eight and a half years old and still going. I've been using refillables forever. And no problems. Same print head, same internal pads. So far, so good. I got two others in box, so I'm not really worried about it. Um, but anyway, yeah. So, you know, the, the the need for some M whatever Canon print. No. When was the last time you sold anything for those printers? He can't remember. So do away with all of that. Just liquidate it. And, and 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 stick with just your big money makers pro 100 is still big the canon printers is still big p800 still seems to be okay because people are using chipless firmware so you can refill those um yeah no problem uh, p900 forget about it there's no option for that at this point 700 there's no option for that at this point either so unless you live in europe so 
that may be something he'll have to um, explore more and just do some cutbacks because, you know, we're all getting old. Our health, our energy levels are not as they used to be when we were younger. We just cannot continue the way at the rate we are. So with me, it's the same way. Maybe sometimes I really don't feel like producing any videos. Maybe physically I don't feel good and I will not be able to to speak with the energy that you guys expect me to speak with and the you know provide that interest on that whatever subject I'm, I want to talk about so happens all the time I just want to make sure that I have at least for the last 10 years uh, provided you guys with information that is long lasting that is usable whether it was 10 years ago or 10 years from now like I said unless they come up with a totally totally different printing system what you know now you will be able to apply years from now okay joe bowen says meant that they meant they have ink cart and a, pre a new print hit one color has two components thank you for okay so i still don't know what you mean so so it's a separate, two separate units. Uh, printhead is one unit, and the ink card is another unit. So yeah, good luck. It may not, it may not be able to flow at all. It may be something you'll have to dispose of. Miss Wendy says my new Pro One Thousand has overspray marks with a having printed borderless. It happens. It happens. Um, even though you're not printing overspray, uh, you know, beyond the edges, it will still cause internal uh out atomized little particles just take some um gauze or something soft like a paper towel soft and some window cleaner just regular window cleaner and just clean that plate and clean that plate and uh, if you see actual wet spots on the sponges just blot them use a little pad of paper towel and just blot them a little bit of spray it doesn't have to be ammonia based cleaner either it can be any kind of cleaner ink comes right off with that so just keep it nice and clean because it's that that buildup that will then be laid on the back of your prints you don't want that even though you don't see that it's still something that you don't really want to have no the um yeah the manual Manual describes in the FE cleaning, but also causes this. Hmm. But it is not described if you're removing cleaning the foam. No, you cannot remove that. Don't remove that. Just, just physically blot it. You can actually very carefully spray inside. Just make sure you don't get it places you shouldn't be getting it. And just kind of wipe. You can use um, a little spray bottle with some 70% alcohol as well. That will not hurt anything. Just keep it manually clean. Art says, remember to leave likes and thumbs up to start off the new year. Stay safe and bless everyone. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. Richard Bender says, yeah, that's about what I was getting. So um, even though it's weird, because even though there is no gamut warning that I could see, um, apparently... Those greens are just not reproducible by, you know, the inks that we have available today. So now had I had OEM inks installed, maybe it would have done a better job. But you know what? I look at it. It's just the greens lose a little bit. Let me, let me do, let me do a, a um, I know what I will do. Why didn't I just do this? Let me do a, a um, how much time we got? We're down to one minute. Maybe I'll do that on my own. I was going to do a, um, what do you call it? Jeez. Where I checked, checked the results through the, uh, through the uh, ICC profile. Let me open up. What should we open up? How about Photoshop? We'll do Photoshop. Soft proof. Stupid. We'll do soft proofing. Let's see what happens when we soft proof this. 
And I'll use my profile for that. Okay, let me get a drinky. Okay, folks, let's take a look at this. I'm going to compress this a little bit smaller than normal. Expand it a wee bit. Like so. So we're going to view gamut warning. And nothing turns gray. You see that? Nothing is turning gray. So that means it, it should be okay, right? So we're going to undo that. We're going to soft proof. Custom. We're going to find a sub right here. I got it already preset. Relative colorimetric, black point compensation. Preview. Now, isn't that something? Look at this. You see what's changing down here? That's the only thing that's changing. Look at that. It's just... This is becoming a little bit brighter, but color has not really shifted much. I want to look at this again. And yeah, I can I could see how the rendition is a heck of a lot brighter. Now let's do this. Let's do simulate paper color. Now that's a little bit closer, but not perfect. Again, I always say, you're not gonna match your monitor. You're not, okay? But you're gonna come close. And to me, the results that I got here from that image, when I look at it, it's not like what's magenta in the background looks brown. Okay, that, that would be tragic. It's good enough, more than good enough. To me, it looks it looks quite lovely. I would be completely happy with that rendition. And just, you know, be aware that there are limitations to what you can get. So this is this is really more realistic to what it would look like. So if we click on this, this is a uh, simulate black ink. I don't do that. I simulate the paper color. This is more you see how this is losing its brilliance? So this is what it's going to look like on real paper. At least this paper. A, a, a glossy, uh, what is it? What did I have chosen? A sub-glossy. And of course, let's see again. Yeah, it does lose quite a lot of the brilliance that the original has even though let's just do this let's take that off see only when you actually apply the profile let's use a uh, epson profile let's look at the xp 15000 here i got way too many profiles here Oh, you wanted to know about the Pro 1000. Let's see how that works. And I'll have to use Platinum. Here we go. So we'll see what that looks like. About the same. About the same result. So yeah, that's. I think that's to be expected. And if you can live with the results you got, you know, these results are quite pleasing to me this actually in person it's a lot more brighter than you see here on video it's a lot stronger yeah this is this is not bad i'll have to look at this under regular room light afterwards but this does not look that bad i like it thank you all right so you see, folks, how you can basically get an idea 
of what the output is going to actually be like by soft proofing. And you can actually then adjust that image a little bit more saturation if that's what you think it needs because you think it lost too much saturation during the soft proofing. And that's more likely to be the way that print looks on paper. It's assuming that you know you're going to be printing on a on a paper with maximum reflective qualities if you print on a matte dull paper it might even be a lot duller result so you never know uh it just depends on the uh, the way that the paper can reflect light because that's how it's able to uh, reflect the colors of the dye or the pigment inks that you lay down on the paper as simple as that the more reflectivity the paper has, the brighter the, not brighter, but the more intense and more, you know what I mean, more pop uh, the paper will have, the print will have. Jerry says, Canon XPS driver on Windows Pro for Pro 100. Canon implies it is a 16-bit driver. Is it really 16-bit or just 8-bit enhanced? It's 8-bit enhanced. It's only available for what OS? Windows. Windows cannot print on 16-bit. Mac can. Apple can. Not Windows. There is no XPS driver for Apple, for you know, for uh, Mac OS. Why? Because it doesn't need it. It prints from. If you have a 16-bit file, it will print it in 16-bit. Use Q image. Okay. The XPS will do the same, basically the same job as Q image will. I don't know whether Q image will extract a little bit extra quality, but the dithering is what does it. Okay. So yeah, I don't care what Canon tells you. It's not going to be 16 bit. Okay. So listen, okay. I know you probably posted this a while ago. What do you have to do? Do you have to do the fooling that I have to do with two cartridges or does it work in the original one? You reset it, you pop it back in and it is accepted as being empty. The ones for the Pro 1000 with this resetter, if you go through the process of properly extracting the cartridge off, off of your panel, you cannot just open the door and remove it. It will not see it as being reset. You have to tell the printer, I'm going to remove the cartridge, the, the maintenance cartridge, then reset it. Then when you put it back, it sees it as being empty, even though it's packed with ink. Okay. I don't have to have a second set, a second cartridge, if you will. What about the XP15000? Do I need to have two cartridges, one reset, and then one to erase the previous code? and then replace the one I just reset. You know what I'm talking about. I talk about that before. Happy New Year to you and Mrs. Jose Epson 158550. I won on 8550. I do. Rich says, yes, you have to show the printer another tank. Okay. So you need two of these. So you need two of this. I already got two of those. Now I gotta find some material that I can use to repack them. Awesome. Or two chips. Yes. Good. Wow. That is such good news. You'll be hearing from me soon. All right. Okay, everybody. Again, I thank you all for the support that you have given me throughout the year. This has been a good year. We had our downfall with this pandemic and things went kind of south when i got hacked and all kinds of things happened but all in all it turned out to be a wonderful year uh, pc was able to develop some good products for you all and um, more good things are coming down the pike i know he has some ideas that he was gonna talk to me about but he wanted me to hold up on that a little bit and uh, we'll discuss it maybe when he comes on as a guest again probably in the next couple of weeks i'm still trying to get uh drew the owner of um, red river to come on board here and tell us what's happening what's new down in texas and what we have to look forward to 
as far as papers go. And I love Red River papers. If you guys need any kind of um, supplies of any sort and you are a user of Amazon, use my affiliate link, please. Just use it. It's the same exact way to shop. Okay, You can actually search. Once you log on with my affiliate link, you can do your search. Any products, whether it's a vacuum cleaner or whatever, anything you buy using my link, I will get a little recompensation for your purchase. It'll cost you the same amount. Okay, they are actually paying me for having you shop through my link. And on top of that, I also have a bunch of printer related supplies as well. So everything you might need, you can find everything that Amazon sells. If you just use my link, you'll be able to purchase it regardless. All right. Thank you so much. We'll see you in one more week next Sunday. Bye bye, everybody. So long.